inviting us. Please let me know if uh, anyone has trouble hearing us. So um, I thought I would start with uh, the beginning, number one. Okay. Uh, the fund transfers, diversions, and reserves. You'll note in your packet there are two um, enclosures. The first is a letter addressed to uh, Senator Cummings mm -hmm. on the um, AG fees and reimbursements, Secretary of State Service Fund, and Unclaimed Property Fund. It will show you the amounts, and we can confirm that they will cause no undue, undue harm or stress to those departments that are uh, <coughs> diverting those funds to the general fund. Um, and second, there is a, a, a chart that uh, entitled FY19 General Fund Final Distributions. And you know, you'll know there uh, that we will close out the year with slightly over $51 million of surplus. Um, so it's uh, another good year. Um, looks a bit like last year. Um, and according to Act 72, the, the budget recently passed, half of that will go to the State Employees Retirement System Medical Benefits Fund, OPEB, uh, which amounts to almost $26 million. Uh, we'll go to Beezer's OPEB, and that's going to go a good way towards helping us um, get off the mark there with the funding. So, um, another $9.4 million of the uh, surplus will go to the Human Services uh, Federal Holding Account, otherwise known as the Blue Book, um, and that will stay there and carry forward into fiscal 20. And then the balance of that uh, fund, of that uh, surplus, will go to the Rainy Day Fund. So that's a total of uh, a little over $16 million uh, to go to the Rainy Day Fund, which will bring that fund up over $30 million. So that is the uh, distribution of the surplus from fiscal 19. And yes, sir. if I might just ask mm -hmm. a question. So I know that a year or so ago, um, our sort of back of the envelope calculation for the long-term savings as a result of these kinds of down payments, if you will, or extra payments into the pension system was effectively three times whatever that initial amount was. Is it safe to say that the, let's call it 25 million, over the length of time will be roughly $75 million of total um, um, positive benefit to the system? I don't think there's any question that it's a positive benefit to the system. I think the math is a little different there because we don't have a, a pre-funded fund that we can use those assets to offset an accrued liability. Once we get to pre-funded status, then I think the man will work perfectly. What we're trying to do is build up enough assets so we can get out of PAYGO and get towards pre-funding. When we're towards pre-funding, then the um, actuaries will be able to perform that math. But the reality is anything that we can put towards getting to the status of a pre-funded um, liability would work to our benefit. I should know this answer, but I don't off the top of my head. The AHS federal holding account, the extra 9.4 million that came in, is that reflected down below or is that separate in the blue book or NBR, whatever we want to call it, and what's its total, the NBR now? So um, we don't consider that to be a reserve. OK. Um, so it's not so reflected that's in not the box. reflected there. OK, so what's that total if we add 9.4? Do we know our total in the MBR? I think we have that. I don't. Sarah, Sarah. So the balance um, as of fiscal year 18 closeout was roughly 25 million. It's still preliminary for fiscal year 19. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's holding roughly the same. But that 9.4 million is going to come into the NBR, and then there will be a direct application um, in fiscal year 20 for the NBR uh, for that same amount. Okay. For the clean water, correct. Okay. But this is that's the clean water, water for what we borrowed to right. do the clean water this year. Okay. So we can't spend. 
No, we no, already. In other words, we did. did some more. Well, we, <laughs> we already have. Okay. Uh, so as you see uh, down below, um, the we listed out for your viewing pleasure the various uh, reserve balances. Uh, which, according to our calculation, come to just over $224 million, um, which comes out to be slightly over 14% of last year's appropriated amounts. So, it, I mean, it's, it makes a substantial difference and a substantial increase. We were in the mid to low 13s, I believe, last year. So we've, we've moved up in the... Uh, reserve balance department quite substantially. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does the administration have a target number percentage that they're hoping to achieve? I'm just curious. Or are you happy with 14.2, or is there a target that you're looking at? I, I guess as a um, financial administrator, I'd say I'm always happy with more reserves than fewer. We don't have a, a target. I was at a conference in which our readiness for the next downturn was rated by various fiscal folks. This was at NCSL. And for the only time ever, Vermont was rated as a red state, which was very bad. We were not prepared. And their definition was to meet our current budget and then have enough to, to assume the additional <coughs> Medicaid caseload that generally happens with a downturn. Do we have any idea if we're close to that? To? To having enough in reserve to cover our present spending <coughs> plus an addition to Medicaid that occurs with a downturn. Do you want to? Uh, I, 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 I recall the analysis, Senator, and I don't remember what the threshold was to get Vermont out of red to yellow, but you know, as Adam said, uh, the higher the percent, the closer we'll, we will be getting to moving out of uh, red. The other factor in that analysis is that we have a very robust and expansive Medicaid program, and so because of that, we are at, always going to be at more risk of federal impact than right. uh, other states. Okay. The other thing I would add to that is also in that analysis, they look at revenue streams. Yes. And we have a very more volatile in many states revenue stream. I know we solved some of it when we did the case. They weren't looking at the caseload reserve and a couple of other things, I believe, is reserves. Right. And we, we did put that in as a general fund. Reserve. Yeah, actually, and that, I'm yeah. glad you said that. I mean, that until budget adjustment wasn't part of reserves, so they never looked at them. Um, with that included, I suspect, the, uh, and particularly, actually, relative to our neighbors in New England, we're actually pretty enlightened in that regard. Uh, so, but anyway, we uh, point noted. Okay. Can, can you remind us what the estimated uh, gain was at the end of the fiscal year? Not what the estimated gain was when we passed the budget? Gain. Well, the estimated uh, surplus, if you will. Um, we thought it was we pretty close, I think. Yeah, right? yeah. We, we had a reasonable idea of what it was. Uh, the way the kind of the, the protocol is is you don't recognize these funds until the right. emergency board. But we, we had a reasonable idea uh, that it was somewhere in the forty to fifty million range. Trying to like go with the, we're a little nervous. If, you know, it's May and June. It, those revenues can be quite volatile. But I mean, I don't think this number is a surprise um, to us relative to. I remember the discussions at the end of the budget. So. And, and there was discussion about uh, what was contributing to this. Has there been any opportunity to understand that more clearly? I mean, there's been general discussion in the media, like, well, we don't know if it's one, it's, it's, if it's the federal tax changes or if it's other things. And at this point in time, do we know anything more? Here this afternoon. Yeah, I think yeah. the economists will have more to say on that. It's partly, we believe, partly due to the uh, federal 
tax reform from two years ago, which we're still seeing the impact of. Part of it is due to an unusually long economic growth cycle that seems to continue to power on. Um, those are the two factors that come to mind. I'm sure there'll be much more said about that. Okay. Yeah, just, and, and so this afternoon, we should also learn how much of we could expect to be ongoing money or if these are still one-time events. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Does that take us to two? So the, the next item is a report on uh, the JFC website is merging the State Health and Resources Fund and the General Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, essentially looking back on action already taken, uh, where uh, several head copies. The, um, in the FY19 budget adjustment, uh, several revenue sources were moved um, from the State Health Care Resources Fund to the General Fund. Um, the, the action, uh, I think it should be noted, was a, um, an example of, of effective consensus work between the, um, the legislature and the executive, in particular between Joint Fiscal Office and Finance and Management. Um, because those, those revenue sources were essentially fungible with general fund in terms of supporting Medicaid. Uh, but because they were uh, deposited into a special fund, uh, the rating agencies did not recognize them as, uh, as resources that the state has <coughs> access to. Um, and it made our uh, general fund look artificially low, even though uh, the effect of any uh, shortfall in the state health care resources fund was that the general fund would step up to, uh, to fill the gap. So it, those, those funds were essentially acting uh, like general funds, but they were reflected as special funds. So uh, beginning uh, in FY19, um, those funds are now reflected as uh, general funds, and they will be incorporated in the total general fund forecast uh, provided by the economists, although the actual projection for those will continue to be done um, by uh, the respective departments that, that have done the forecast in the past. Um, and this will raise the state's general fund by approximately $275 um, million a year. And it will also mean that uh, in the event that any, uh, by having more diversified uh, set of funds going into the general fund, it means that if uh, one particular is fund is, uh, one particular revenue source is down, another one is up, uh, they can offset each other. So uh, for instance, this year, cigarette taxes were significantly lower than projected, um, and the other general fund revenues are, are able to absorb that impact. And the cigarette tax doesn't reflect the new e-cigarette tax that went in, I think that started July 1st? Right. Right, okay, so. But it will. Perhaps some of the, the cigarettes have been going down, but perhaps some of it has been transferred to vapes and right. maybe we'll pick that back up. Yes. We have lost revenues because of the move to age 20. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that's the goal, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. I'm just saying, so that had to be netted. Yeah, we're, we're successful, hopefully. So question regarding the source versus availability. I noted that the, the claims assessment, uh, there's more in source versus available. Is that an allowance for bad debt? Uh, I believe that that is the portion of the claims assessment that goes to um, health information technology, but I'm, I'm, I can check into okay. that. Is there an allowance for bad debt in the claims assessment? Uh, there is a, a bad debt, um, um, not sure for claims assessment, um, I believe each or is of the, the items. Provider tax? Um, I'm sorry? It's the provider tax. Right, right. We're making allowance in the provider tax uh, side. Um, for sure. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Just 
Okay. If I may. Yep. Um, to Senator Cummings' point earlier about our status as a red state, their analysis, I mean, I, you don't know what NCSL was thinking, uh, but their analysis probably did not include this transfer, so they would not, not have been recognizing. I just want right. to be clear that that was probably old data, and, and in fact, we are position, positioning ourselves better and better. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And now we're on the five-year spending analysis. So, um, to say a few words on that, I, you know, I'd start by saying I don't think. Um, Is there a handout for that? The five-year. Uh, I did not provide okay. a handout. No. This is the one that's been in the press. Right. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we're going through an exercise over the summer um, that looks out longer term on budgeting and uh, revenues and expenditures. Uh, I'll start by saying I don't think this exercise would be at all foreign to the Appropriations Committees. We, particularly in the House Appropriations, have had conversations along those lines over the years. Uh, but what we did, we started out with two broad goals. Uh, the first is to kind of move out of the year-by-year -year budgeting and look at a longer-term horizon, which we put it five years. <laughs> five years in this way seems like a lifetime. Um, it really is, you know, it goes through two gubernatorial terms, two legislative terms. But nonetheless, it, I think it, it um, in the scheme of things, is not too far out in the horizon so we can't make reasonable predictions. Um, so we wanted to expand our horizon. And we also wanted to look at a projected gap and think of ways that we could lessen that, um, as uh, the Joint Fiscal Office frequently says, the alligator, the alligator's mouth. Um, so we uh, included all cabinet departments, basically any department that reports to a cabinet member. Um, it was predominantly the executive branch uh, were included. We also included internal service funds. Um, we excluded um, areas that are not specifically budgeted. For example, the education fund, um, the legislature and the judiciary, uh, which are budgeted, but they're kind of outside the executive branch, as well as independent um, elected officials like the state auditor, the secretary of state, um, the treasurer and the like. But you know, even with those exclusions, uh, we were somewhere over 90%, it was like 95%, I think, of total budgeted um, state um, expenditures. And um, the finance and management put together the exercise. My colleague, Matt, actually did a lot of the heavy lifting, along with Rich Donahue, our budget director, and Tim Mateo, one of our budget analysts. Um, and again, it included well over 90% of budgeted items. We made certain assumptions because we had to. Uh, we assumed uh, general fund revenue would grow by 2%, which is not an unusual assumption in the scheme of things. Um, and we assumed um, internal service fund department receipts would also grow by 2%. Um, federal funds and special funds were a little bit more challenging. Uh, we had to do that you know, department by department, kind of looking at historicals. Because we wanted to be reasonable there. Um, and we accounted for certain known factors. Um, for example, our phase out of the enhanced match for CHIP uh, benefits. But you know, in general, we, we made assumptions that were within the norm. And similarly, with expenses, we did the same. You know, we looked at historical increases in salaries. Uh, we looked at historical increases in fringe and historical increases in our internal service funds. So it, uh, it's kind of, in the scheme of things, it's not, a, on the one hand, I'll say it's not a particularly challenging exercise to, when you think about the assumptions and putting them together. It's very challenging to do it department by department. Um, but, you know, we used broad assumptions, and, and you know, maybe it shouldn't be surprising, but when we looked at what we're facing in fiscal 21, um, you know, this was done you know, back in May and June when we looked at kind of our likely gap in 21. It's pretty accurate. 
um, you know, when we actually put pen and paper and figure it out. So anyway, that's what we're going through this summer. We hope to uh, have cabinet and, and commissioner recommendations uh, by the end of the summer. Um, you know, I think, I, I, I think the way we're looking at this is if we can have really a, a, a compilation of small but significant changes, they can all add up. We're not thinking of blowing up the entire state of Vermont government. Um, and I'll have to say that it's, it's not like we're starting this as the only administration that's ever fought this way. So, you know, the old saying in this bill, there's no such thing as a new idea. I mean, there's really very, I mean, that old for a lot of our exercise. I mean, many of these issues have been thought about. Um, and, you know, I don't want people to start jumping to conclusions and, and think that they're going to come in and we're going to have recommendations to change all of Montpelier. But, I, you know, I do want to communicate that we're thinking very hard about how we deliver government, the programs we deliver, um, and who delivers them. And, um, you know, I think it'll be, actually, I think it'll be a very useful exercise. Uh, so. Senator Ash. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure how this does, in fact, differ from what the legislature or every other administration, including this one in the uh, previous three years, does. I mean, we're never thinking, oh, we'll do this year's budget, and then everything is solved for the future, right? I mean, we're always thinking, which I think is one of the reasons why about 98% probably of the budget doesn't change from year to year, because we're thinking longer term as we make programmatic decisions and spending decisions. And I guess I, my only, if you can come up with better ways and propose them to the legislature to deliver services, that's great. I mean, that's always welcome. But I, I hope that people don't find themselves in some exercise which bogs people down without much of a light at the other end of the tunnel. The governor, when he ran for governor in the first place, talked about uh, finding some percentage efficiency changes that would not affect any Vermonters in every single agency, and that was going to keep the budget level year after year. And then it never quite works that way because it's not like we're we don't you know, pass the budget and say, oh, here's a squish factor of 2% to uh, have float and waste. Um, so I just hope that it, as you're directing people, that it really is with an eye to making recommendations that would be toward positive changes in programs um, that are realistic and not a sort of a road to nowhere of um, you know, theoretical exercises that are uh, would either be not palatable to the people of the state or the legislature's gonna, you know, really resist or even agencies would resist. Fair. Okay, I have Representative well, could, could you articulate what your criteria are, <coughs> what, what you've asked uh, commissioners and others to work toward? Because I, I haven't heard you say that. I mean, and I think it's been reported in the press in different ways. So I think, at least as I remember, there was some confusion as to what the time frame was of what you were asking folks to work toward. Well, the time frame is over the summer, uh, so the end of August. But, but, but in terms of trying to find savings of what percentage in what number of years? So we asked departments and agencies to, um, again, the, the two goals I mentioned earlier, to look longer term after five years and to look at their gap that we provided for each agency and department and at a minimum try to find a way to close 20 percent of that okay so that's the piece of that you hadn't articulated i'm just asking to try to be explicit about what your stated directions are right okay. um these exercises are always good because they challenge um what we do I, if you look at the large areas of spending, there, if you take education K through 12 off the budget, and then you take, depending on what you do in health care, um, that's about two thirds of the budget right there. So, in some ways, um, my question is, and you said that departments would be looking at lean, but um, it, to me, one of the fundamental questions is, should this be something? One of the priorities of government is this the role government should be doing. Because you could be doing something that's perfect, lean-wise and efficiency-wise, but it may not be your top priority. And so if you're um, 
uh, to some extent, you can say this is a fundamental service that we want government to continue. We think we could do it more efficiently and achieve savings. Or you could say, well, we're doing this very, very well, but we just don't see that as a priority in, in this um, budgetary exercise, and is that something government should be doing? So I see really two, two, uh, uh, two decision points there. Um, I know that you talked about looking at lean and you know the um, outcomes and so forth, and you may have very good outcomes, but that may be in the scheme of things you're going to say that isn't a priority that rises to the top. So I wondered how that process across state government would look, and um, in terms of decisions or recommendations about we create programs. But we never go back and say, um, and, and to some extent, I think that's what we're trying to get at with our child welfare study is, you know, what are we funding? Is it giving us the return? Is it something that made sense 20 years ago, but the world has changed, the demands have changed? So I'm just wondering to what extent that kind of uh, thinking or analysis is going to be part of this. Uh, that would be central to what we're doing. Um, you know, as actually um, we pointed out when we sent the original notice to departments and agencies, of the roughly $6 billion we spend um, in state and federal funds, roughly four of that, four billion, are programs. So, you know, we often talk about reducing staff or hiring freezes and all the stuff that we go through. But the reality is that's a minority of what we spend. And so we're acutely aware, and I know this body is acutely aware, um, that the majority of our spending, I would dare say the vast majority of our spending, is program related. And to your point, Senator, I mean, we need to decide whether those programs and services that we deliver are a priority. Virtually everything we do in state government, I'm comfortable saying, is important in one way or another, but we ultimately have to uh, determine what's most important. And um, you know that's part of the exercise for the agencies that oversee the various programs. And it's, <laughs> it's very difficult. It's much more difficult talking about whether we should deliver a program than it is to talk about how many people we need to do. So. It, it, it sounds, it, this is aligning exactly with the language that we put at the budget during, you know, it was in the, the, the House side and taken out in the Senate and then agreed upon language in um, conference committee of doing exactly this exercise. I'm going to start when I said this won't be unfamiliar to the right. people sitting in this room. So. Well, that was to look at the future and trends, whether it be homelessness, whether it's demographics, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, that's it's a, it's a very large um, analysis that you're undertaking. Um, I think it's going to be a busy summer. It has been so far. Um, as, as part of this analysis, how are you going to engage the community partners who are delivering the services in the field who are not state employees? Um, we have asked agencies and departments to do their work in any way they believe is important. We haven't reached out to community partners yet. We thought we would think internally about um, how we want to, uh, what the thoughts we have and recommendations we have, but it's an internal exercise. At some point, I would imagine that that's an important part to be played because, again, um, and, and perhaps I'm mostly thinking in AHS, but so much of the work that is, uh, the services that are delivered to Vermonters, maybe not so much, but a good portion is delivered by um, folks who are not on, directly on the state payroll. And I would be concerned that, that we have their good thinking engaged in how to accomplish these goals. Agreed. Okay. Any other questions? All right. That gets us on to the closeout. We got a report.
Antifa. So, Madam Chair, you have, um, as part of your materials, uh, a letter that we addressed to you on the key fund closeout and um, the maintenance program. I do that. I would ask if anyone has questions on that, and I know we have someone from the ARP in the room. I'm looking at the folks that are on the transportation committees. Every one of us. Any questions? No. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm okay. Can we start over? <laughs> He's in the hole. Okay. For the record, Noel Langwell, the joint fiscal office. And I'm Sarah Clark with the Agency of Human Services. Um, so you have in your packet the uh, Medicaid urine report, and so we're just going to highlight some of the highlights. Um, feel free to stop us if you have questions. Um, but the data reflects the most recent actuals that we have to date, um, but there's no actual infections required at this time, not until January. Um, expenditures for the Medicare, Medicaid, local equipment, children's health insurance program, and other related programs, that's all of it, uh, totaled about $1.82 billion. This is about 1% below what we have budgeted, but a little bit above expectations in terms of the state dollar spend. Um, overall spending, total spending grew 4% over fiscal year 18. In terms of caseload, caseload appears to have stabilized um, in fiscal year 19. Um, Medicaid enrollment showed modest declines, about 4%, with decreases in almost every eligibility group. The largest decreases we saw were in the childless new adult, which decreased about 6.7%, and then the state cost sharing reductions uh, decreased about 20%. Um, new adult with child and choices for care were actually up, up 2%. In terms of revenues, um, as Matt and Adam discussed, claims, cigarette taxes, provider taxes, and employer assessment will all be recognized as GF rather than State Healthcare Resources Fund as pursuant to uh, budget adjustment. Um, these, these particular revenues came in 5.2 million below estimate, um, and it's only 650,000 above fiscal year 18 for those specific revenues. Um, Interesting enough, the employer assessment raised $93,000 less than fiscal year 18. This is the first time since its inception that it actually did not raise, that it actually was below the previous years. Um, the reason for this, we think, is because the total FTEs for which the tax is taxed actually decreased despite the fact that the actual tax went up 2.3%. Provider taxes came in $1.6 million below expectation. Part of the reason is what Matt discussed about the State Health and Resources Fund, the general fund, and the cash to accrual. Um, and also, Springfield Hospital uh, did not pay all of its provider tax obligations for fiscal year next year. Our future provider tax forecast will take this into consideration as well. Um, also, as Matt discussed, and Adam, uh, the cigarette and tobacco taxes and the healthcare claims taxes also fell short. Uh, tobacco and cigarette came in about 2.5 million below expectations, and the healthcare claims tax came in about 850,000 below. Um, global commitment waiver, um, as you call it again, calendar year 2017. It phases out the federal match for several investments uh, and establishes calendar year caps on the total amount of investment. We're about halfway through those phase outs. These will be fully phased out over the next two budget cycles with an approximate $6 million in gross each year, 2019 to 2021. Just so you know, the calendar year cap for 18 was 148.5 million, and the calendar year 19 cap was 138.5 million. Um, the administration will likely seek authority to begin the initial work for the next version of this waiver during the upcoming legislative session. So I think we'll be having more discussions on this. Uh, looking ahead, 
Um, this is, uh, they call it the chip dip, and this is actually a term that Stephanie did not coin, which is surprising, because usually she's the one who coins these. Um, but as you recall, the Affordable Care Act increased the federal, the enhanced match, enhanced it further for fiscally, federal fiscal year 16 through 19 by 23%. Um, when Congress renewed this match in 2018, they phased it back down to 11.5% for fiscal year 20, and then it'll revert completely to its pre-ACA enhanced path map uh, for fiscal year 2021. Uh, the 20, and that's a federal fiscal year, so it'll carry into state fiscal year 2022. Uh, we expect a 21 impact is about six million, and a 22 impact is about $12.3 million for the um, New adult, this one's a little funky, but um, calendar year, for as also as part of the Affordable uh, Care Act, in calendar year 14, um, as part of our, the fact that we were a do-gooder state or an expansion state, our, our FMAP increased starting at 75% for the new adults and increased up to 93% in fiscal year 19. But then it actually levels back out to 90% for calendar year 20 and beyond. So that 3% that increment uh, leveling out is going to have a roughly a four million dollar impact. Um, could I, Nolan, state this again? So the chip dip in uh, for those of us who are going to be working on budgets and twenty one is a six million dollar ding on the general fund side. Mm -hmm. And in um, calendar year twenty one is the four million dollar impact also in twenty. Uh, yes. Okay. So the agency in doing its five-year projection and the 20% target actually is having to accommodate a loss of federal dollars of 10 million. Is that? I just want to make sure that yes. um, that I understand the timing of those two um, federal changes. Okay. So thank you. Um, otherwise, the global commitment waiver expires uh, at the end of calendar year 21, and as I mentioned, um, the administration will be looking for authority on negotiating future global commitment waivers. Any questions? On the employer assessment amounts, um, unless I'm missing an obvious thing, it seems the only way the number would go down is if there's fewer workers or more employer-sponsored coverage for the workers who exist. So I'm just wondering if we know which is the case. Yeah, those are great questions. And right now, it's all speculation. So those are the two things that I would think would be is that the reduction of FTEs for which is taxed or a movement of more people to employer-sponsored insurance. And maybe that's an economic. But those are the two things you mentioned are exactly my two speculations. Okay. All right. the, the other thing that's in play there is that the association plans came in for a year. We had allowed them two years ago and did some study. Um, but the feds have said no, one year was it. So we may find a shift back once the plans go away because of the testimony we got was that more employers picked up insurance because it was more affordable. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that one's in flux. Right. Will we have an actual analysis? I mean, how will we, rather than, I mean, we're all speculating, but how are we going to know what, and will we, is that something that someone is going to look at? So um, so the data, though. Do we have, do we have the data? I mean, I would think we do. Well, it's like by the tax department now. Um, and you know, in terms of the, the, the number of FTEs, that one has actually decreased. I have analyses that I've looked at year over year over year of that. In terms of the uh, social factors or the employer's access to more employer sponsored insurance, I don't know if we have any way to really measure that besides the Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey a couple of years from now looking at it retrospectively, or unless there's some kind of further anecdotal evidence. That one's going to be a lot harder to write. But the reduction FTEs, we do have that data. It's actually 
we had two basic organizations that were doing association plans. Yeah. They might know who joined that wasn't providing insurance in the past, which might give us some information. Yeah, well, it's also hard to know. Yeah. It, it may be it may yeah. possible, unless they switch providers, and then we don't know. It's also possible. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? I guess I, I would like to, I would just ask that, can you provide us with the FTD data? Absolutely. Because it, it seems striking that the healthcare sector, which is in fact a large sector, uh, that would suggest that it's a, there's a contraction, yeah. which doesn't seem, it seems counterintuitive to what I have a spreadsheet of historicals yeah. and I'll share it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay, this is the proposal for the electronic health care records. No, I miss, I skipped one. Ah, agent, Mark's acting secretary. Okay, agency in Poland. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to take a second and introduce myself. I'm Martha Max. I'm, I'm the acting secretary at the Agency of Human Services. I've been the deputy there since uh, January of 2017. And since Al's departure, I stepped in in that position. And so I just wanted to come uh, meet with you with Sarah and say hello. And this is the B. 3B. Correct. We're going to be just looking at how EHS ended the year. Great. Okay. So in large part, the agency basically ended on target um, for state fiscal year 19. I do want to remind you that it's still preliminary. We really go through um, the month of September before we actually finalize everything because we close based on estimates of federal revenue. Um, so the first on page two, you'll see a table that um, of the PowerPoint looks like this. Um, and so this uh, table summarizes at a very high level, the department level, what each department's kind of closeout position was for state fiscal year 19. If you go all the way over to the bottom uh, number in the right hand corner, you'll see uh, negative $2.4 million. So that will indicate to you at the end of the day with all of the revenue coming in and coming out, the agency actually had to rely on some of our non-budgeted revenue account, the federal holding account, to the tune of $2.4 million dollars um, and you can see on this chart you know we spent um, total expenditures all funds duplicated roughly um, four million or excuse me four billion ninety eight million dollars <laughs> um, of our general fund which we have a roughly a 970 million dollar base appropriation of general fund we had $23.8 million left in general fund at the end of the fiscal year. However, a large part of that were appropriations that we received either via the big bill um, that passed um, by you in, for state fiscal year 20 um, or from the previous year, balances of appropriations that we're still spending on. So that reflects, if you move over to the next column, $18.5 million of general fund spending. Um, and that's for things like um, the lead program. Um, it's for an electronic health record, which we're going to talk about, um, I believe, next. Um, Live heat, Woodside, a whole, uh, a whole host of items. Um, moving over to the next column, we also will be asking to carry forward general fund of $3.9 million to fund fiscal year 19 liabilities that due to timing and close out deadlines weren't, weren't actually to get the money, able to get the money out the door in state fiscal year 19. So we carry forward those funds to cover those liabilities into 20. That helps set the agency and the departments in a good fiscal standing heading into the new fiscal year. We will also be looking to spend some of our general fund balance um, for Pay Act, about a half a million dollars across the agency, um, which leaves us with about $900,000 that we will be um, looking to help us as we build our FY20 budget adjustment. Um, on the federal side, again, we, we close based on estimates of federal spending. We are um, pro uh, projecting a deficit of about $2.4 million. Um, on the federal side, and so when you take all those sources across at the end of the day, um, we'll be looking to rely on our non-budgeted revenue for $2.4 million. This is the first time, um, I'd say, since I've been the CFO that we have had to use our reserves, but again, 
um, that's what they're there for. And so we, we can provide you uh, more detailed information um, when we're here during the session. Uh, I noticed that the big chunk um, is associated with DCF. Um, 2.4. Yes. Um, what was the funding source? Is that 4E? Um, uh, so if we go to the, what, what are your federal? Yeah, let's go. Actually, so the, the next, um, the next, next slide. slide. The next slide. The next slide. Because I'd say like the, the, the point to take away really um, are some of the challenges that we're facing the Department of Children and Families. And so specifically within the Family Services Division, um, they closed with a roughly $2.3 million deficit, which is largely due to caseload and the substitute care, foster care program, and um, staffing levels to um, keep up with the caseload that that division is facing. In addition, the general assistance program also uh, had a shortfall of $2.7 million in state fiscal year 19 which is primarily attributed to an increase in the demand for emergency housing. So I raise these as um, you know, precursors to what we will likely be talking with you about during the session. We have heard housing was hot, I guess. Yes, it's hot. very hot, yeah. not just outside today. Um, we were able to partially cover these overages by underspending in the Child Development Division. We've also had this conversation with you um, last legislative session. Um, so we were able to use $2.1 million of underspending in child development to help out the rest of DCF. Uh, and we were also able to, as, as you know, we were required to carry forward $2.2 million in child development division for the Child Care Financial Assistance Program as well as some other grant programs. And the balance to cover these shortfalls came from the non-budget revenue account. And that's really the the agencies uh, close out at a glance. And then the next is just shows our uh, chart that shows our spending since fiscal year 03. Um, all funds but non-duplicated by global commitment, so we removed that double count. And the point I want to make to you is that since state fiscal year 16, spending at the Agency of Human Services has been relatively flat. I'd say from 18 to 19, we are experiencing um, an uptick. Some of that is attributable to the level of one-time appropriations that we have received um, accounts for some of that growth. Okay. That's Any questions? There is one other item that you asked for me to provide you an update on, which is the status of the transfer of the Choices for Care appropriation from DIVA to Dale. I am pleased to inform you that we actually did transfer that appropriation effective July 1st of 2019. And you will see that reflected in the FY20 budget adjustment and FY21 budget development documents. Sorry. Yep. Um, back to um, AHA. AHS closeout issues, and specifically DCF. Um, and I'm thinking about the administration's direction to look at the delivery of programs and services. And I appreciate that obviously they can only ask, ask for us, for you to analyze yourself. Um, when I think about what's going on in Family Services Division, that is deeply affected by things that are happening in the court systems, things that are happening, you know, actions of prosecutors, et cetera. Um, it just, it, this is just a deeply troubling area. And I know we're not just saying, oh, it's the opioid crisis, but we really need to go deep and to think across areas um, with other people who are delivering these th these problems into your hands. So I don't have any good ideas, but I know that um, with a, an important work is, be, is going to be done on the big child welfare question. I'm just worried about how we're going to get our arms around kind of these immediate issues and the way they keep forming. So I just, I just hope you can kind of look deep into that while we're also anticipating this, this the work. The first report is coming in January. There so we go. Yeah, help. it'll begin to help. Session. Yeah. And um, so if 
hopefully we'll start looking at some of that front end interventions yeah. and how it aligns with best practice, yeah. et cetera. So I, I, I was assuming that that was mostly kind of within the system. And I'm also thinking about prosecutors, you know, the actions of state's attorneys, local policing, et cetera. I mean, a much bigger and more complex issue that affects that then. Well, measuring variance is hard. <laughs> we know the tremendous variance from court to court. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah. But we're paying for it in this system. Ultimately. Yeah. OK. Other questions? Thank you. OK, now we can move to close. Percentages of behavioral health organizations that are taking this on is actually still quite small. Um, so it's nice to see that as we are pushing forward with um, all payer models, other innovative approaches to healthcare reform, uh, Vermont, of course, continues to be in the lead in this regard as well. It's also um, the implementation of electronic health records also allows us to challenge this notion that behavioral health and overall medical health should be separate from each other. Um, and as we look as a state around um, trying to look towards integration between mental health and whole health, uh, this becomes a real opportunity for us to do that. Um, and one of the biggest benefits, I think, of electronic health records overall, um, it really can be distilled down to a better coordination of care. Um, and that's for both health care providers and mental health providers. So a good example is that if you're a doctor looking at a health record, 
um, and you're seeing the cardiac information, um, if you have uh, information from the mental health care provider um, related to uh, uh, panic attacks, for example, those things are both connected um, and can really help inform good decision making, um, which is going to lead to better patient outcomes, reduce need for hospitalization, emergency department visits, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think that we are on the right path in the state um, in thinking about how we advance electronic health records uh, for our mental health providers. From an investment standpoint, in terms of the state dollars that have been appropriated, uh, really the, the designated agencies are moving forward as health care providers. Uh, they are trying to implement a business tool that is going to help them meet their business needs, operational needs, coordination of care needs. Um, this includes uh, their ability to participate in our health reform efforts in the state. Uh, so Department of Mental Health has moved forward with payment reform. Uh, we see this as another step in the right direction. Um, and also for the designated agencies to be able to fulfill their responsibilities as a member of the accountable care organizations um, and their connection with One Care Vermont. Um, I think it's important to note that their process, I think, of embarking on this journey started in late 2016. Is that correct? Um, and that this appropriation made in 2019 as part of the FY20 budget um, just covers a portion of the cost. I think the $1.5 million is just shy of 25% of what the overall anticipated implementation costs are. Yeah. Uh, so I do think that uh, the fiscal appropriation um, that came as one-time funds um, specifically asked the Agency of Human Services and Vermont Care Partners um, to demonstrate how the designated agency's electronic health records uh, project uh, supports the goals laid out in the current health information exchange plan and other current health reform efforts. Uh, so uh, folks around this table are aware that that strategic vision uh, is around creating one health record for every person, um, improving health care operations, and using data to enable investment and policy decisions. Uh, so we think that the electronic health records are in line uh, with the overall strategic vision uh, of the health information exchange plan. Uh, and as a state, this is outlined, I believe, um, in the memo that the Agency of Human Services submitted as part of its testimony. Uh, we've learned a lot about what it takes to make uh, state uh, health improvement technology efforts successful um, and have applied uh, our learning um, to that work uh, to improve outcomes and we're very proud of that work at the Agency of Human Services. Um, that said, it's just important to remember that the designated agency EHR effort um, is not a state HIT project. Um, but we did look at um, approaches and criteria that other health care providers uh, would be adopting and using uh, if they were you know, standing up an EHR um, and that the designated agencies would likely meet those criteria. Um, specifically, the designated agencies are working with Vermont Care Partners um, and have selected EHRs that meet federal meaningful use standards for connectivity. Um, the second standard for meaningful use is the ability to connect with statewide registries. Um, and then, of course, meaningful use um, also asks uh, whether data is used for data-driven improvements. Um, and one thing we do know that there are reports through Vermont Care Partners um, compare performance across the designated agency network um, that can be used by the network for performance improvement. Um, so we believe that those factors um, really meet the intent of other kind of comparable incentive programs uh, for meaningful use. Okay, thank um, you. Meaningful use kind of gives me a rash because um, <laughs> the fact is our experience with Vital would suggest mm -hmm. that we had EMRs all over the place that met the federal meaningful use, mm -hmm. but they were extremely problematic mm -hmm. for the health information with the vital initiative mm -hmm. um, with the health information exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of uh, the cost of support, mm -hmm. the additional special programming to deal with the exchange of data, the quality of data. And so part of the language that we put in was to say, we've learned a lesson from that vital experience. So I understand we want meaningful use, but we want meaningful use in a way that is um, uh, cost effective. Um, and I know that the number of systems, and, I, and you said 
you know, obviously this is not a state IT project, mm -hmm. but in reality it's going to be a state funded IT project. I don't, you know, where does, where does the revenue to the designated agencies flow? Um, it's through generally most of the money is over 90% is from the state. So, you know, maybe the designated agencies look at it as their project. But I would say that most of us who are um, dealing with the appropriation view this as a, a state-funded IT project, and we look at that delivery system more as a statewide network of services. So um, uh, part of the concern, and I know Dan is going to speak to it in his um, memo, and that is um, uh, making sure that we are, um, because this is only one five out of almost a seven million dollar project. I would suspect that in order to get the project completed, um, the funding source is going to be back to the budget, um, unless there's some funding source that maybe other people are aware of, but I'm not aware of. So um, my concern is um, just that. Um, articulation of not being a state IT project, but many of us who put in a million and a half, I hope we could do a bit more, but we couldn't, but we know that there's more out there. And the question is how we go from here. If the state of Vermont were doing this and CMS were doing it for us, we'd have to have an APD. Mm -hmm. We'd have to go through an elaborate funding process that they would raise questions, and all of that would be at the front end. And we're kind of coming in part way into the process which makes it more difficult. But I do think that with some of the questions that um, our IT consultant, Dan Smith, has raised, we're going to have to take a, a look at you know, what should be um, some of the questions in getting additional data um, as we move toward uh, this completion. In terms of out, out of a million and a half, I don't know how each agency is getting what, how those determinations are made. And there are a host of questions. So I guess I just want to say, when we put that language in, you know, it was in a way to say that we we really want, um, uh, we really want to, I really want to express our concerns about how we um, feel um, that we have the data and the information and the oversight. And, and so that's why I get a little nervous when we say it isn't a state project. And it isn't in a technical way. But there's tremendous accountability because these are state dollars. These are public funds that, um, and these are all general fund. Because there's, we, there's no, we've explored this. There's no match available. We've tried. I mean, a, a number of people suggested maybe we could get Medicaid match, um, and that came to a dead end. So I just, I just want to express um, in this forum, and that's why we wanted to have the Joint Fiscal Committee get um, this information. And this, but I don't see this as the end of the discussion in terms of the overall uh, plan. And that's why it's so important that what we're doing today, in fact, we're not going to say, oh my god, that system, we should never have gone that way three years later. And um, we've got a, a real problem. So I just want to speak for myself, um, but you know, a million and a half of general fund against the seven million need. Um, is a very significant investment of, of state-only dollars, and um, I, you know, I, I realize it is somewhat of an anomaly, but I, I do feel a tremendous responsibility that we no way replicate our experience in terms of cost, delay, et cetera, that we experienced with electronic medical records with Bible, and I was part of that, and I think Tim, you were. Um, uh, you, most of us were here. Um, and <laughs> yes, yeah, so Senator Hitchell, we share. Uh, so it's, I realize yes. it would be diagnosed as ill-defined anxiety. But <laughs> I, I think 
we, well grounded. We share the same free-floating anxiety, um, <laughs> concern, and overall sense of responsibility on getting a good outcome for Vermont dollars. Uh, we also find ourselves at the Agency of Human Services wanting to be responsive um, to a one-time appropriation where uh, the direction of the designated agencies in terms of the selection of their EHRs um, has or they've been already been well down that path for some time. Uh, so I think we we want to have um, a product and an outcome that is cost effective, that is efficient, where we have learned. Um, from uh, Vital, uh, we also have incredible content expertise um, within Diva uh, to help us understand that. Um, and then we are also uh, trying to be uh, good partners um, to the designated agencies as they have kind of already embarked on implementation. Uh, but certainly it's within our um, commitment uh, to articulate what we see as additional areas of oversight um, and additional questions, uh, quite frankly, that need to be answered, which we also articulated um, in, the, in the memo. Um, I think one of the uh, points that we were trying to make is that as we look at um, other healthcare providers that have kind of moved forward with implementation of EHRs, um, where the designated agencies are in terms of their implementation from uh, uh, meaningful use and center place, they're, they're on par, if you will. Is that the only gate that we want to be looking at as we move forward? No. Um, there are additional gates to ensure that um, that investment, uh, that we receive that uh, outcome that we're hoping for. Um, so uh, the next note that I was going to make very quickly is that that said, um, there are there's still work to be done um, to meet the goals of the state and designated agency network. And um, we've identified, I think, specifically what some of those areas are where we think there's additional questions um, that weren't answering. Um, that includes addressing the 42 CFR compliant consent piece, um, which uh, Deputy Commissioner Samuelson can speak to in much more detail than I can. Um, to really demonstrate very clearly um, that the EHRs can transmit data in a manner that the HIE can capture it, um, that the, we are really seeing um, a demonstration of clear interoperability with each other and other sectors of the health care system as we move towards this aligned system um, and ability to report to payers as health care and payment reform evolve. Uh, a couple other areas that we also articulated in terms of um, ongoing conversation and discussion are related to implementation and governance um, and sustainability. Uh, so from an implementation standpoint, um, the benefits of implementing electronic health records um, are, are, can be big. Um, implementation is very difficult and very complex. Um, and any article that you read related to successful standing up of EHRs, um, there's a direct link back to having uh, robust implementation plans, um, and that includes uh, governance to ensure that we are not moving in a direction of distributed accountability, but we are moving in a direction of shared accountability um, and responsibility. And when we think about the implementation of EHRs, um, it does require an extensive investment in technology infrastructure. Um, there are also um, readiness of users and human factors that have to be identified, which I'm sure Simone will speak to, in terms of your relying on your end user, if you will, are the staff and clinicians um, who work at the designated agencies who have to commit to utilizing the EHR, um, that there is goodness of fit in how they do their work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that they will be committed to it, um, hence why having uh, very robust implementation plans, clear articulation of governance, particularly that this is being embarked upon as kind of a network effort, which is the strength of Vermont Care Partners, are things that we think should be given great consideration to. Um, and then the final point is, of course, related to sustainability, um, that we would anticipate that ongoing investments will be needed by the designated agencies um, to continue this work to achieve those core functions um, and what we would hope to accomplish through the EHR. Um, and we need to have a plan uh, for what that's going to look like um, from a budgetary perspective. So I have another question, and it relates to some designated agencies have both the DS program, mm -hmm. and some actually only have mental health, and then we've got others that are only DS um, service providers. Can you just clarify? Um, the electronic medical records as it re relates to um, two different programs and then the differentiation between agencies. So are we actually putting um, electronic medical records into DS-only agencies? Um, 
and or are we bifurcating electronic medical records for those DAs that serve both? So this is an implementation for nine of the designated agencies. It's nine of the comprehensive designated agencies. The single service agencies, the DS only ones, um, they implemented a new EHR three years ago. Um, and that's, that's a, it's a different vendor. Um, but within these, this is for the nine that are moving forward with new. So with the DAs that have both mental health mm -hmm. and DS, yeah. they will have two systems? No, they'll have one. That's what I was asking. Uh, yes. They will have, even though they would have implemented the DS one three years ago? They, no, it was just this, sorry. Um, I know. It's so. We have five agencies that are single service agencies, right. developmental disability only. Mm -hmm. um, they implemented a, um, an EHR. Those five agencies. Those five. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. That just was not clear on the Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So I'm just going to pause for a minute. Um, just I want to turn to Jenny and just see if she has anything that you want to add to what I stated, Jenny, that you think would be helpful before Simone um, presents their overview plan. I, consistent with your feedback, Sarah, I think one of the things that was in our recommendation and our memo um, goes to Senator Kitchell, what you had mentioned, that uh, we would recommend that in the key areas that we have just laid out are some deficiencies, that if additional funding were to go into those, we would recommend further oversight. I share the concern that you do that, that meaningful use of EHRs do not does not necessarily mean that they inherently connect to the um, to the Vermont Health Information Exchange. In particular, they don't break the data down in a way that can be ingested, and the current HIE is structured for healthcare, not mental health data. So additional work needs to be put in those areas. Thank you. <coughs> so my concerns have some basics. Yes. <laughs> I do. Yes, they do. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Simone. Okay. Oh, yes. uh, with, the, the, with the five DS, um, with those electronic yeah. health records uh, and then this new system that is being developed, will they talk to each other? Will these, what kind of interaction will there be with the DS, with the DA, within the DAs compared to the DS that are separate? Are they just two completely different systems or can they relate to one another? There, there are two systems. We have a data repository that where every EHR feeds our repository. So in that sense, they can, um, we can aggregate data and analyze data, um, but we are not creating a separate health information exchange. They will be able to um, talk to each other, the interoperability piece of it, assuming you know, we build the necessary interface. So in the future, if, if the system were to change and the DAs all stood alone and the DS became um, their own or these five DS became part of the designated agencies, how would those records transfer? Can they transfer into the new ones that we're developing? I'm just wondering yeah, if they're doing so the data, Within DS, the data that's being, uh, that are being collected is the same. So the, when we were, um, as we were walk, working on this implementation, we were also standardizing forms. This past, seven, this past seven, eight months, we um, standardized about 50 forms. So we're working on standardization across mm -hmm. the entire network as we have the different EHRs, so, which isn't much different than the hospitals or... So if the five standalone no longer remain standalones but became part of the larger DA umbrella, all that information could easily transfer into one system? Um, good morning, yes, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, I only um, am concerned about working easily. And also speaking theoretically about some future system okay. that we know nothing of. I'm sorry, this is Ken Gendras, HIT director for, for My Care Partners. Okay. Sorry, um, I've never testified before. <laughs> so, easily is certainly a question, and uh, so uh, I would be remiss if I were to. Um, be cavalier about making that kind of a comment about some future system about which we know nothing. But yeah, generally speaking, given a, a well-designed uh, project plan uh, and given the continuing improvement in the state of technology, yeah, I would say that if we got to that point, that would be the case. I'd like to make one more quick comment, if I may. I don't want to... Um, get too uh, concerned about sharing information uh, between the designated agencies and between the SSAs. There are some clients 
as we call them, patients that do receive services in multiple uh, mm -hmm. systems, but generally speaking, the vast majority of the folks that we serve work with one of our member agencies at a time. We're much more interested and concerned with connecting to the other care providers, hospitals, um, phys physicians, and other care providers for those individuals. So although our systems will and can have the ability to transfer patients across from one to the other, we're much more interested in integrating the care with the other providers in their given community. And that's the hard part. So I think that's the fundamental question, is what is going to be my experience as a client or as a patient within the system? Mm -hmm. And are we there? Are we going to be? So I'm receiving services from Washington County Mental Health, and I walk into the ER up at our hospital. Will my hospital have access to my electronic health record at Washington County Mental Health? So eventually is the answer to that question because there are two factors there. One is um, a, a direct interface between Washington County Mental Health and the, um, and the emergency mm -hmm. room. Um, once this EHR is implemented at Washington County, then it's a matter of the capabilities of the hospital and the willingness of the hospital right, to develop that interface. That's one option. The other is Vermont Health Information Exchange, the VHI, but in order for us as a designated agency, in order for us to have our data go into the VHI, um, we have to, and the state and vital are working on this, um, come up with a 42 CFR part two consent management mm -hmm. platform and process, which is the protection of substance use data. Um, we're working on that, um, and as we are implementing our EHRs, we are working on um, including opt-in for those people who um, have substance use um, data in the EHR, but that platform hasn't been, and that process hasn't been completed yet. So we're getting ready so that when we do have a part two solution within the VHI, we will be ready to have our data go into the VHI, but as of right now, we wouldn't do that because we don't have, this. the state and vital, we don't have a process for that. I, I, my confidence is going down and down, and I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean that. It is a it's a federal election that we don't have a solution to. I, I'm just, I, I can say that being a patient in, in a physical health office that is actually part of central Vermont, and they can't even transfer records, and so I, I just, I, my anxiety, I'm, 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 my free-floating anxiety is yeah. just as good as Senator Kitchell's, and I'm, I'm not hearing that. I, you've identified the problems, but we're a long way to the solution. Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize that it's a, so can I just take a step back for a second? I co-chaired the SIM Health Data Infrastructure mm -hmm. Work Group. I've worked on writing um, two of the HIE state plans, and I'm now on the steering committee, so I'm very committed to health information exchange at the state level. Um, but it's an entire delivery system solution that we need to come up with. And as we're doing it, we also need to it, um, enable the, the providers to have IT systems that whereby they can have the data, analyze the data, provide the best quality care that they can, and also report back to the state. So there are different levels, but I think it's important to understand that the, the solution to health information exchange is with all providers and with the entire, the whole health delivery system, right? So these are EHRs that have that capability. They absolutely will be able to do that. Um, the question is, can we get all those other pieces in place too? And some of that, you know, states across the country are struggling with part two yeah. for good, I, I guess, good reason. So Simone had, uh, and Vermont Care Partners had uh, provided a fairly robust report um, uh, to uh, inform uh, the committee. So I don't know if you want to go over some of the highlights. For that. Sure. Would that be helpful to walk through the report? Okay. Um, if I may, yes. um, and, and I haven't had the opportunity to read the report, which is good. I was going to print it out, but then I saw that it was 42 pages long and decided not to. Thank you. I will read it. My concern here is the there is not one person 
who is designated as overall lead uh, for this project. One throat to choke, is that what you're talking about? You want one well, well the, when the Agency of Human Services, um, when we received a briefing from them this year, the questions that I asked in that briefing all went to who's responsible, who is the lead, who is the person making the decision, who reports to the, to the agency secretary there was one person. And I was asking that question directly to her. So I felt very much better that we were going to have a great chance at success because mm -hmm. there was one person who understood everything and how it was all supposed to come together. Yeah. Because you are multiple agencies, mm -hmm. each with their own implementation person, who we don't give them enough money. We don't, we don't uh, appropriate enough money for each of these agencies to have a person whose sole job is to implement electronic medical records or electronic health records, whichever you prefer to call them, at, at those levels. So unless you folks are literally going down to each and every agency and doing it yourselves. Okay. No. OK. So I am very concerned about that piece. But then when you throw on top of that that there's no independent review. So my question here that I would like you to answer over the course of the next few minutes is, why an independent review would be a really good idea here, and why an independent and leave the dollar amount out. We can we can uh, not withstand the dollar amount. So leave the dollar amount out. Why it would be a really good idea to do it, and why it would be not a good idea to do it. Okay. How many minutes do I have to think about that answer? <laughs> Almost none. <laughs> yeah, I mean you're right in that. These are separate implementation processes, and each agency is responsible just as they have been in the past. And I would imagine, just as primary care providers of QHCs, many hospitals are as well. Um, and by the way, you mentioned FQHC, so it, everyone basically knows that I had a heart attack a year and a half ago, and were it not for me calling my FQHC and informing them that and saying, so I need to get some work done, oh my god, you had a heart attack? Right. My cardiologist, I could throw a baseball from my cardiologist's office and hit my FQHC. I don't. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a whole lot of, actually I don't have any confidence that my FQHC it feels like it wants to play ball in, in the electronic medical record sharing arena. Mm -hmm. Okay, well we're talking about the person <laughs> the agency, we do want to <laughs> play ball. Yes. Um, I agree. And. I mean, I think that, that I, I completely understand that frustration that the FQHC had the, the electronic medical record they needed at least to have, to be able to provide your care within there. Anyway, okay, independent review I will get to. I cannot say that there is one person overseeing this entire project. I would, um, that being said, uh, we, um, well, can I, I think some of the questions yep. will be answered as I walk through this. So um, I'm just going to take a moment to do it. Um, there were, in 2016, a variety of reasons why the nine agencies came together um, to talk about developing an RFP and going through an entire selection process that lasted a, a number of years. We had seven agencies that were on a, on a legacy um, a legacy platform that was on trajectory for sunsetting. We had one agency where their EHR vendor was going out of business. We had another that was going to be revamped. We, all of them were not keeping pace with the requirements. So there were a number of reasons we came together. And we felt that it was important to um, find the efficiencies, as we often try to do at, amongst the designated agencies, in developing the RFP, posting it, and, do, and going through the vetting process. Um, so we, in 2017, hired a uh, consultant to help us with that process, someone who had been very involved in and identifying, going through these processes, and implementing EHRs. Um, and so in 2017, we posted it. Uh, we started that process and posted the RFP. The RFP was relatively unique, and I think it's important to talk about it, because not only did it, and I guess this doesn't provide that much comfort anymore, but not only were we requiring meaningful use certification, um, but at, amongst other standards, but we were also focused on finding an EHR that could 
really work within community-based agencies. I think you all know that more than 50% of our services and supports are provided in the community. So having something like a mobile solution was really, really important to us. In addition, we were focused on um, finding solutions that would enable the agencies to fully participate in an integrated delivery system with value-based payments, things we knew that we were all as a state involved in and moving towards. So that was another really important piece for us. Um, we funded the project management through a grant from HRSA. Um, they were generous enough to help us with that. We received 16 responses, and after our initial vetting process, uh, we ended up with five. We brought those five vendors in for a number of days each, went through you know, clinical applications, billing, all the different pieces. Um, and I'm not going to get into the whole two years of the vetting process, but it was, it was a robust process. And we ended up with um, two vendors, NetSmart and Credible. Um, and we have four agencies that are moving forward with Credible and single installations, and we have four agencies that are moving forward with NetSmart as a unified platform, and one is still in the decision-making process. Two of our other designated agencies that are not part of this are also on NetSmart, so that's important just to know that they are already in the state of Vermont. Um, the two HRs are not being custom-built. They're you know, high-quality, off-the-shelf, products that are being configured for the specific agencies. Uh, we, we wanted to also have vendors that were capable of um, enabling the, report, the state reporting, which may be um, not as high tech as what these agencies, I mean, as these vendors are capable of doing. So they have to be ready to sort of move into the future and hold on to the past. Did you have a question? Very quick question here because I did read this part and, it, and when I saw it configured to the agency's needs, mm -hmm. that raised red flag immediately. Are they meant to be configured or, or are the agencies asking them to do something special? No, it's just that you know we have monthly service reporting to the state, for example, but, all the state they, forms. But these, these platforms are meant to be configured oh, in a manner that we are configured. Absolutely. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. We just want to make sure they yep. had the capabilities yep. so that we could do all of them. As you know, there's a lot of... If, if you're asking them to do something that they haven't done before, no. then we've got an enormous problem. No, definitely not asking them to do anything they haven't okay. done before. And I think it's it's a great point. I was uh, able to be briefed on, I think it was the NetSmart system, <laughs> um, and had a lot of questions having implemented some uh, technology projects in the past, and sometimes we can overdevelop something off the shelf, um, and then we end up incurring extra costs down the road because we have to maintain developers and IT people that then have to maintain all of those changes that we made. So um, I did have a lot of my uh, fears about that uh, put to rest um, because of how off the shelf it is and because those configurations really made sense um, from a technology standpoint. Yeah. And maybe you're going to <coughs> address this later, but um, why wouldn't all agencies go with the same one? Tell me the pros and cons. It just seems to divide half with NetSmart and half with Credible and one undecided. Why aren't they all using the same system? Yep. No, that's a fair question. So um, when we wrote the RFP, um, we had the lofty goal of everyone being on the same system, which maybe would have been good, maybe would, I don't know. Um, but in the end, like each agency, you know, they're independent agencies, and each agency really had to decide does this work for my agency from a fiscal perspective, from a end user perspective? Do, do my, does my staff like it? Are my clinicians actually going to use it? Um, from a, an assessment of their community needs, who do they need to share data with? Um, who do they need to coordinate care with? Uh, and all those different factors. And in the end, I, you know, the agencies really chose the ones that worked best for them, for their agency. And I still see it as. Um, as a great success. I mean, honestly, when I've spoken to other providers in the health delivery system, um, they've said we would never have attempted to do that. So I think two platforms is pretty amazing, honestly. I know it doesn't seem that, but for that question. I'm a client of Washington County, okay. right? I move to St. Albans. Mm -hmm. I now am, is it North? North Western I am now a client there. Yep. They're on two different platforms. Can my records from Washington County be transferred to St. Albans, or I go into crisis? No, it can be transferred. 
So I'm still living in Washington, I'm still there to think, but I'm visiting and I have a meltdown in St. Albans. The St. Albans people would be able to access my records and <coughs> some idea of what might be going on with me. So our agencies work really well together. Okay. Um, when there's a crisis with somebody, they're going to make sure that the information flows. And at, at, I guess what I'm asking is, though, can those can they just go into the, their EHR and find information? Probably now? not. I mean, no. my experience is the baseball. My husband's base and the doctor that prescribed is 50 feet away, but the emergency room doesn't know what was prescribed. Right. You know, and I think that's why we get to the the beehive. Right, yeah. the health information. So the purpose of the health information exchange is to, and so know. these could all go through BHAP. So, Avenger. but once we work out the federal, whatever the new yes the problem is. So when we went through the vetting process, we worked with Vital to ensure that the um, vendors met the requirements, their connectivity okay. requirements. Those requirements have changed since then, but um, we've been working with Vital. And they're, they're relative, actually, they're relatively the same. Um, but we've been working with them to ensure that we will continue to do that and we will con we will be heavily involved in the part two. So you could go through vital or be um, if and when we can resolve the federal prohibition on sharing, is it substance abuse information? Yeah, it's substance abuse. Okay, this is... And, and the channel, yes, I won't go into part two. Okay. <laughs> that is the Fed's problem. But if it can resolve that problem, the machines can talk to each other. They have the capabilities to talk to each other. It does require an, the development of an interface. Just as it does for hospitals or primary care, it's the same for any provider. That's not a DA issue, that's just a, that's a VHI issue. Or not even a VHI, it's just a it's technology issue. It's issue. issue. All right. I had a question yeah. um, about the federal requirements. If about, I think the last uh, statistic I heard was 75% of individuals with a substance abuse disorder, uh, substance use disorder, also uh, have a mental health diagnosis. And so that you have a very high percentage of co-occurring uh, conditions, and which trumps what? In other words, um, you, would you have <laughs> how do you how do you split up that individual by diagnosis and federal requirement? That seems like, or does one it's sort of take precedent over the other? Um, so uh, I'm you know it's a really I, good question. I, I guess I'll let you uh, thread that needle, but it just seems like an artificial uh, old thing delineation. Um, that you're having to meet. So I agree with that, um, and it is a very good question. At this point, we consider any data going out of the designated agencies to be part two data for that reason. So we are not separating that out at this point. I, I don't know how you do that. Um, yeah, I was just to your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You've got to deal, deal with both. You can't deal with just yeah. one and not the other. So, yeah. I'm just curious if yeah. Vita weighed in on um, on having one or whether they were perfectly fine with net smart, net smart and credible. Yeah, no, they, they didn't weigh in on that. I mean, there's so many different EHRs going into the VI at this point. Right, and, that, and that's just and that's a problem because we have systems not talking to each other. We have information not flowing, and we know there's other issues, but. Yeah, one okay. area. Oh, sorry, one area of additional review that the agency of human services did add, and it's inclusive of those kind of seven follow-up steps, um, mm -hmm. is actually doing some test feeds um, from the selected vendors um, to the HIE. So that was yeah. something we had suggested um, as a way to monitor and that. You know, I think, and also just that, that's a very good point. And I think the other point I'd just like to make is that technology changes so quickly, right? And the, the focus right now for us is on these EHR platforms, but it's also on the data that's going into that. So ensuring that it's high quality, standardized data, and the survivability of that data is what's important. And the reason I say that is because that's going to be true across the delivery system with all these different EHR vendors. We're never going to have one EHR for the whole state. 
Well, I mean, I don't so, think you're welcome. But the data is really, really important. We have a high focus on that. And these, that these um, platforms will enable us to really be focusing on that data as well. So uh, I'm just referring to the language that we put in the budget. Okay. Um, and making sure that what we have put out, in fact, aligns with what you're saying. And um, so the plan shall summarize the development implementation um, and demonstrate project will support the goals that are set forth in the statewide health information technology plan as to come, and at a minimum, the connectivity requirements set forth in the health, uh, health statewide um, HIP plan and the requirements of CMS. Yes. And so I, I just want to have confirmation that the language and the conditions that we placed on the funding um, are ones that we feel that um, the plan meets. I, I do. Okay. I do. I mean, this, we have on page six the, um, the state HIE plan's primary goals. We talk about how it moves us towards those. And the whole state is an act of creating one health record for every person, right? That's our goal. But these EHRs really do get us much further in that direction, for example. Um, thank you, George. Would you rather be yes, no, I'm, I'm watching the clock, and even though this was supposedly a couple minutes fast, we've got a really tight schedule after this. Can I get you talk? And Dan Smith is also here at the committee, who was our cons tech consultant on this. Um, so if you want to hear, I'd like to give him a couple minutes, and I want to let you finish up. Just want to let the committee know this might put more pressure on the other end of the conversation as we move forward. Oh, just let me know. So let you finish what you think we need to hear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, I, th I do think um, on page seven, I think it's really important, and you can all spend time reading this, but it is a core piece of business. This is the hospitals and primary care. Um, these vendors, these platforms will enable operational efficiencies at the designated agencies, will support the shift to value-based payment, which is really important as we're moving forward with mental health and DS um, payment reform, um, developing capabilities to participate in population health initiatives, the supporting the integrated delivery system. Our current platforms, we cannot, they don't have the capabilities of connecting with other providers. Um, and, and enabling quality improvement and care delivery. Um, it's also a really big change for the front end users and for the staff. And if they are, as, <coughs> as you all know, if you're comfortable with something, you're more likely to use it, which enables the data to come through. So that's really important. Are you really working? I, I, have, yeah. I have a bias here. Okay. My primary care provider retired early yeah. because she didn't grow up in an era when right. you typed with one hand and or with your thumbs and sure. talk yeah. at the same time yeah. and found herself up until 10, 11 o'clock every night transcribing. Um, are we working, is your workforce of an age where this is second nature and not going to be huge? I mean, they're, they're coming from already using a, an EHR, just not as nearly as robust of an EHR by any means. Um, and they're really excited about things like the mobile solution that enable them to be out and okay. to really still be, as opposed to going out, doing the work, then having to come back, taking the day, you know, so it, it does make those efficiencies. So they will have a mobile that, <clears throat> much like the police force, that will go with them and they can do the import or get yeah, the information. So if I've got somebody in crisis, I, don't have crisis. I can get the information and know right. that yeah, person's the background and what might be causing the issue. Mm -hmm. You can help me work with it. OK. Um, I had a whole lot of other things, but I'm going to skip around here. Um, I would like to just quickly, if it's OK, walk through the, the financial go live summary on page four. I think that's important to walk through. Just because it, it, the numbers are slightly different than what we originally stated. Um, and they are different in part because we, when we first um, estimated the implementation costs, uh, they hadn't started the implementation. Now that they have, they've been able to refine the numbers a little bit. So what we have here are the agencies, their go live dates. So some are going live, three are going live September 3rd, um, which is soon. Um, and the appropriation would 
just be um, going towards the implementation costs, not ongoing costs. These are all subscription-based models, so it's really different than having to purchase the hardware and software and have on-premise um, infrastructure. Um, so we put the current annual, it does not include the building, the, um, the initial build, including hardware and software, doesn't include ongoing maintenance, you can, you can read all that, I don't need to read it for you, but, um, and then the, we have the estimated implementation cost. What we put here was vendor cost and external project management. We didn't include, you know, loss of productivity, um, additional staff time, obviously it's going to take, it takes an entire, a lot of people to be implementing an EHR. Um, and then we have the new annual cost and the approximate delta. But the delta is probably less if we added all of the um, maintenance and other things into current annual. What I want to point out is that implementation is at 4.6 across the 10 agencies. Um, and the, um, the delta between current and new is, is a million across the nine agencies. And so um, it, it's just important to know. Um, that that is, um, a, the cost is a bit more ongoing now, but the upfront, upfront cost is less, because you're not developing it internally. And, uh, and the risk mitigation is huge. I mean, having it subscription-based and cloud-based is a really big difference than having it all in all the equipment in one secure, locked room that could. So, if I may also, yes. yeah. moving to this subscription cloud-based model also is going to reduce the IT infrastructure costs right. on the bottom line of the agencies, but that's not reflected that's here. Right. They're currently maintaining a pretty robust stack of equipment with blinking lights on it that supports their current system. That's all going to go away because it's going to be part of the subscription in the cloud-based system that they're, yeah. that they're subscribing yeah, to. Yeah, we'll move to some place in New Mexico somewhere. <laughs> Um, okay. So, wow, there's a lot more here, but um, welcome to our world. <laughs> I know. Well, I could talk about this for hours, but um, yeah, I gave you 45 minutes. That's I, I did, uh, so. So that's on the funding. We our our proposal, VCP's proposal. I see this VCP's VCP's proposal for the um, formula for distribution of funds would be to. Um, allocate it equally amongst the agent, nine agencies, even though their costs are slightly different. Um, we felt that it was an equally difficult financial decision for everybody, and everyone figured it out in their own way in their agency. Um, and so um, when the executive directors met, that was a recommendation that they made. Um, and again, just at some point, you know, page 15, it looks maybe complicated, but it's really pretty amazing to have um, three vendors amongst the 16 agencies all feeding their clinical data to one repository as we focus on standardization and on analysis for quality improvement and reporting to the state. It's unique um, and it's really exciting um, work that we're doing and I just think that should be noted and these EHRs will also help with the analytic piece of what they're, you know, what the agencies are doing in terms of the services and supports they're providing. Thank you. So if, a better way, perhaps, to get an answer to my question. Oh, quite, that's okay. Question. That's sorry. okay. No, that's okay. The better way to get an answer to my question, because I would like yes. an in-depth answer to my question, would be to provide that before the next legislation, before we start again in January. Okay. Now, I'm prepared to support this absent, absent hearing something in the next few minutes that I'm not anticipating hearing. Okay. Uh, but I would like, before I, I, I allocate additional funding to this project, I'd like to the answer to my question. Okay. Uh, you know, why? And a yeah. really good reason and why not? Yeah. Really good okay. And you're okay with that coming after this? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very finally, the Agency of Human Services, um, are we on the right track of the electronic health efforts? Yes. We did outline seven key areas that we think would warrant additional analysis and review um, that should be taken into consideration as we go forward. All right. Committee. Do you have any specific questions you'd like for Dan Smith, or can we just move this along? I would like to have Dan give us briefly yeah. Yeah. what happens after this and the areas that we need to be paying attention to. Because one of the areas that we've talked about, and that's your question, where's the locus of accountability here? Uh, who is that individual, ultimately? Um, and there's some other areas. I, I think we need to have that information because we know that this funding, uh, unless something 
miraculous happens is only going to be the first installment. And so uh, I really think that Dan has summarized it here, but I'd like to hear very quickly from Dan okay. what it is that we um, should, that he wants to focus our attention on as we make this decision, which cannot be made in isolation, as far as I'm concerned, with um, our future course. Okay, we will let these folks off the hot seat. Thank you. Dan, you want to come join us? Can you tell us in 30 seconds? I think Jane just asked. Uh, it's going to take me more than 30 seconds to well, process actually, what Jane just It won't take that long because you pretty much said everything that I'm going to say. But uh, I'm Dan Smith, the IT consultant for the Joint Fiscal Office. And I think the memo that I provided earlier pretty much says everything. Uh, it would be nice if there was an independent review. However, this is not a state project, and it may be that there just won't be one. This may be the independent review right here in this body. Um, that's that's where we sit. Not encouraging. Other than that, the, the things that I have really questions about going forward, and other than Fagan mentioned it, you mentioned it, is in all of the IT projects, the state has had real challenges over the past four years. One of the biggest things that got them on track was getting one person in charge, and that's been true of judiciary, that's been true of IE, uh, vital. You know, we've changed the organization so we can say, okay, you own this. And when the legislature or me or the GFY has questions, we have a person to go to and say, hey, there's a question, how are you going to address that? <coughs> and especially in a project like this that involves multiple agencies and integration of data. And the technology side, I think, is good. The justification, everything's good. It does worry me that there doesn't seem to be somebody that really owns this. So I, I would like to see that change over the next couple months. I'm not sure how it can be done. That's something that my care partners and AHS may look into. The other concern I have at this point is the financial numbers. Going from the draft report of a week ago to the final report from Mark care partners, there was a significant change in the numbers. Uh, originally, the, the development cost was 6.7 million, now it's four something. The ongoing operations and maintenance, the original projection was an annual increase of $3.5 million. Now the final report says the annual total appears to be somewhere around two. So I, I'm not so concerned about the numbers themselves. I'm concerned with the fact that we may not have a real grasp of what this is really going to cost. And going beyond that, what is that going to cost the state in the long term? Those are things that you know, may not need to be answered today, but I believe before the next meeting of this group, you might want to have a little more clarity on why the big change in the numbers, what are the estimates going forward, what is the state going to ask for? And that's pretty much it from Concerns. Uh, I appreciate that, that last comment about not maybe being so obsessed about the specific numbers at this moment, but rather how it is that we're finding ourselves making pretty significant changes. Because we do have to put it in perspective that every other element of our healthcare sector has had swings that dwarf yeah. what we're talking about here. That doesn't mean a million dollars isn't a lot of money in terms of like annual operating expenses, but we don't want to um, let these. Uh, movements of estimates cloud our judgment about the wisdom of this larger enterprise, especially since all who have come before have committed more obscene uh, overspends. Okay. I, I, I guess the question I have is if we give this the green light today, is, that, is it more or less likely that we will resolve the, the question that you have, particularly about the single leader? Um, I think you could probably approve today, and as long as we're specific on the questions we want to answer by the next meeting, I think the people involved have been very responsive as far as getting the information we need. And they could, if we say this is a concern, we want more information, I think they'll be responsive. But I think the question about having a single locus of accountability isn't an information question, it's a governance question. Correct. Um, yes. So the, the getting more information isn't going to help. Right, I was speaking on the financial side. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and I would feel much better if we had that one person that said, I own this That's project. Right. So I guess I still have the same question. If we green light it today, how likely is it that we're going to have a single uh, locus of responsibility identified? 
and that's something that I can't, I mean, you might Market partners and answer that. Is, is that even feasible in this organization? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 All right. So, committee. Well, we, have, we have a decision. I see someone who was testifying looking, trying to respond. Yes. I'd like to give them a chance to respond. Uh, sure, yes. Um, so, just to the first point about the lower implementation costs. So, the reason it is different, it is different. The reason it's different is because we took out um, the staff time that was being allocated um, because it wasn't, it was very hard to do across the agencies in the same way. We took that out of the estimate. So that's the primary reason um, why the implementation costs look different. We decided to stick with vendor costs and external project management of which I'm working stuff. So that's important. I wanted to say one other piece and that is that we do have a EHR governance committee that meets and we talk about the implementation, we work through the issues, people, you know, agencies are working together. One person for, um, uh, accountable for the nine private agencies will have to be discussed. They are independent agencies. Um, okay. Alternatively, it's our money. And we can we could have a direction of if you want this money, this is how it's going to work. No, I know it's not that. You may have a chair of the board that would yeah. be the designated yeah. person that yeah. would yeah. be accountable. Yeah. As accountable as you can make a person we are paying. Can I just say that? I mean, I, I think the questions we're raising here are questions which came up when we first started talking about it in the health care committee and, and but they you know, it's important that they all get articulated. Yeah. I think there's a certain I think we, we should be aware that there's a certain irony here that the only reason we're talking about it here is because we made a commitment or a preliminary commitment for some one time money. Yeah. That this project was in fact has been underway for a period of years now and we've stepped in because there was the good fortune that we might have been able to support this system with some one-time money in this one instance. Ironically, we were going to all pay for this regardless, because it's going to be, it was going to be, and is going to be, an expense of this, of the, of the DA system. So we're going to pay for it one way or the other. I think it's important that we have these questions and had we not, had we not allocated one-time money, we wouldn't have even been having these questions in this type of form. So I think having us continue to have some kind of oversight or some kind of continued accountability is probably the best we're going to get at this point. But a single point of responsibility, I think, would be important. We have a motion. So we need to make a decision here. We sooner rather than later um, to approve the plan. Um, with a possible addition uh, to continue, uh, well, I'll continue. We can add any possible addition we want, or we can say no. We'll postpone this till our next meeting. Um, decision is ours. Should I make a motion? Sure, take a shot. So I put it on the table. Um, that this, the Joint Fiscal Committee would approve the plan that's presented today for the development of the uh, electronic medical and health records system for the DAs that's required, but that we would also include that we would request that the DAs continue their work with AHS and JFO um, for continued project review regarding the change in estimates and also the single point of accountability of the system. May, may I suggest amending or providing an addition that, that we ask them to address the points that are raised in JFO, uh, Dan's memo to um, yeah. JFO, yeah. which covers a couple of those, yeah. but I think okay. there were some yeah. other. Yeah. Can I say other I agree. Yeah. That's by our next meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Has everybody got the motion? Yeah. I'll second it. Okay. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those say no. Anything in those? Thank you. Thank you, yeah, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
including two benefits and actuarial methods to improve sus pension sustainability over time. And getting to something that you folks did last year that I think you should be commended for. Uh, the state has taken some modest steps toward key funding OPEB liabilities and has made some progress in those liabilities through collective bargaining with unions. The state has also benefited from recent uh, favorable health care claims experience. This relates to the two items that you did. One, uh, paying off the loan for the uh, teacher OPEB uh, system which puts us on a track to begin to, to, to accumulate assets beginning next year that can be used for pre-funding. And uh, the, uh, the, the determination that 50% uh, of the remaining surplus after all reserves have been uh, uh, fully uh, filled would go to the, um, uh, the state OPEB. Uh, the state OPEB already had about $22 million in the kitty. Um, and added another $25 million here, plus we had $2 million in terms of some of our appropriation. So we have a pretty good size amount of money uh, that uh, can be used toward pre-funding, and uh, uh, that, that is something that's um, very important. I'd also point out that uh, the OCA liabilities dropped uh, this year by oh, about $242 million uh, because of some of the negotiated changes that uh, that the employees made with the administration around health care coverage and, 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 uh, and some of the contracts that were, uh, were addressed there. You'd have to ask the administration for the details of that. Um, I'm gonna get, we'll get a little lost in some of, those, uh, some, some of the uh, issues around health care. Um, yes. One of the things around the methodology ratings is around demographics. Mm -hmm. And worldwide, rural areas, are getting really influenced by um, population changes. Um, and the Northeast, um, and I, I'm just wondering, just because we're old doesn't mean we're poor. Actually, there's a lot of wealth with older people. And um, so I realize that we have this historical bias toward the answer is youth, but people are living longer, we're higher educated. Um, and I'm just questioning, the methodology and the reliance on, on you know, somehow, uh, and we talk about, we put a lot of focus on the incentives and um, importing our answer. I'm really concerned, we've got about 3,500 youth that are sort of peripheral to the labor market. And we need to start paying attention to some of our own in-house human resources. Um, because 3,500 versus 60 or all these huge successes is much larger. So I just want to put that on the table is a strategy is making sure that we are doing everything we can to, um, to develop and, uh, and experience the full potential of a lot of our kids, our young people who are um, really not participating at the level they should in the labor market. So I, I, you look around this room, you know, the demographics, unless we say, you know, it's a public policy, you go out and adopt two children, um, everybody. Um, I, I just think we've got to look at some other strategies. And I, you know, this year we put some money in for youth employment for that purpose. It was very modest compared to some of the incentives that we're offering other places. But I just, I, I'm just like, we're getting hammered on demographics. And it's a rural, and we're predominantly a rural state. It just seems like it is very, um, puts rural states at a disadvantage in how, um, how our financial house is rated. Well, you know, uh, we can't tell the rating agencies how they're going to put together their their, uh, their structure. We did. Well, comment. could we offer some suggestions? <laughs> uh, the National Association of State Treasurers did to Moody's uh, when they uh, gave us an opportunity to comment on the, the new uh, 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 <coughs> uh, rating. Um, and uh, we did, in fact, I was president of NAST at the time. And we did point out that it was. So, did that new rating actually help or hurt us? Uh, that new rating hurt us. Okay. Um, and uh, we did point out that we thought it was somewhat um, um, challenging for, for rural states. Um, but, you know, obviously they have the right to rate the way that they believe is appropriate. 
Um, I do think the demographics, that we see some trends. Uh, Jeff Carr participated in our meetings with the uh, various rating agencies. We started to see some stabilization on the population for the last couple of years and pointed that out to both rating agencies. The other thing that uh, I think is important is that uh, some of the studies that have been done on this have been done during an economic decline and in the post-recession and property uh, values and house values uh, had not caught up at that point in time. And if you take a look at uh, uh, Massachusetts, for instance, which is one of the areas that we have the most in, in migration from, Massachusetts, uh, house values are now, now back to form. And that gives a person an opportunity if they're looking to move to Vermont, for instance. You know, selling their house there, they're not selling at a loss. In fact, selling their house there and coming to Vermont, uh, you, make a, you may make a, a profit in doing that and find a very good job in our, in our labor force. So there are some trends that we see that are positive, uh, but we've got some work to do um, on, on these issues. Yes. So I find the way the rating agencies judge state performance to be horrible in a lot of ways. For instance, states that they would apply their measures to have huge poverty rates, mm -hmm. ignore the environment, have terrible education systems. And you know, one of the expenses that we have, which is reflected in the positive way, is making more contributions to cleaning up our waters. Yes. Well, lots of states are just a lawsuit away from having a huge liability on their books, but in those states, no one has yet sued. Right. And we, in a sense, are constrained and punished for proactively addressing what are effectively public problems. Again, I'm and not that, that, to me, is one of the, the problems here. And, and it's, hard to under, it's hard to understand the collective delusion that there is a simple policy switch which is going to fundamentally change demographic trends happening all across rural America and our whole state is considered rural. Like, attracting a 1,000 people here, which would be a huge success, doesn't change the demographic trends that are being described. 5,000 people does not change, even though it would be desirable, doesn't change anything here. I don't know that there's a single government entity in the United States that has successfully had a policy lever that has single-handedly done a thing about demographic trends. So I feel like we're in a really bad spot because we're going to keep being encouraged to do these little political maneuverings to be attractive and create an inflow of people. And I, I can't think that any business would operate under the belief that that's going to work. Well, you know, again, I'm not the policy person. You folks are. And so um, I'm going to turn that back to, to so you. So my question then is, if the Treasurer's group has been unable to impress upon the rating agencies that different strokes for different folks is maybe the appropriate way for them to evaluate a state's credit worthiness, how might we approach <coughs> the rating agencies to do what you're just trying to turn back on us? Um, certainly. It you know, they take, you know, comments. I think that what we try to do in our rating agency presentations is emphasize the positive. For instance, clean water. Um, we had uh, Secretary Moore present on that uh, during, during our rating agency discussions. Uh, we do get high points for governance, uh, very high points for that. And I think that that's extraordinarily important. They see the changes in terms of our pensions. So I think that they see, and I think we're turning the corner on some of those things. We, what you folks did with S96 this past year was significant in turning the corner on our clean water. And I think that that's important in terms of uh, um, people's interest in coming to Vermont. What you folks have done over the last few years in terms of funding the pensions and funding the OPEPs, we're turning a corner on these things. So we are taking control of those issues. There are certain issues that are outside of our control. I would agree with you the demographics is a very difficult thing, particularly in rural and particularly in New England. Um, but I do think that there are things we can do to attract employees. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that we're working on is the, the Green Mountain Secure Retirement Plan. And if people have an opportunity to save for retirement, 
uh, in their jobs. I think that that's something that's a positive. Uh, so I think there are things that we can do, the educational system, and linking, linking that in terms of workforce. There are things that we can do to help. There are also factors that are outside of our control um, in, in, a, uh, in a New England state. Uh, uh, and, you know, we try to get those across, but, the, you know, uh, from, uh, we can comment to the rating agencies, but again, it's, 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 it's their... Sure. And if I might, just one more question. The, yeah, the, one of the, I guess, dilemmas is, and the, they praise us for coming in consistently under the recommended annual mm -hmm. uh, borrowing level. And it raises real issues about the extent to which Vermont is governing itself anymore mm -hmm. when it comes to constraints that are externally imposed upon us that we follow through. So demographics, one of the most important things would be affordability of housing. Yes. As you know, yes. any attempt to do a large, another large housing bond, which is a prerequisite to drawing young families and recruiting certain types of businesses with high paying jobs is more housing stock. And for the rating agencies to celebrate a decline in annual bonding capacity when that is the, probably the only government tool realistically available to do a significant increase in our housing stock means that the very things that are prerequisites to succeeding in turning some of these corners in a more robust way are being taken out of our hands before we can even use them. So I feel like our governance is really at risk at this point with the way the rating agencies apply a single set of measures across all types of states who have different needs. So with respect to the uh, bonding, uh, someplace between 25 and 33 percent of the money that's outlaid through, cap uh, uh, through the uh, bonding process is interest. Uh, you're paying interest over, even though we have a good interest rate, you're paying interest over a 20 year period and it adds up. And I would prefer to see us use a, a, a lot of states, a, a good number of states are not implementing uh, mechanisms that uh, use cash uh, or supplement bonding with cash. Uh, pay as you go. Pay as you go, exactly, uh, Senator. And for me, um, we should be exploring those opportunities. Uh, years and years and years ago when I was a uh, uh, financial operations manager for a town in Connecticut, we implemented a program. My boss came up with this, that wasn't my idea. Um, and we created something called the Capital Economy Program Expenditure Fund. And we put a set amount in each year. We had rules about not using it all in one year. And that started really paying for capital projects and lowering the cost of doing those capital projects. But I think that's something we should explore. And I've all been, as you know, doing a housing study for the summer. You've given me, I think, five different projects this summer. I want to thank you folks for those projects. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, see, the you do a good job with the first one. <laughs> uh, the water one no, was uh, uh, one where I wasn't in the room. We should, but, we should uh, not have a capital bill, theoretically. Uh, well, you know, again, <coughs> other states are tightening their belts around that and using more pay go. And we should explore ways to get there. Um, and we are going to be doing a comprehensive uh, housing um, uh, study over the summer. We'll come back to you with some recommendations. Okay, I'm going to have to move yes. this along because Tom Cavett and the auditor are in the rooms. Well, thank you very much. Any other any questions? And, uh, Anything else? You know, my goal, by the way, is to get back to tr to AAA and be triple AAA, all three. Oh, okay. And we're going to continue to work with you folks in the administration to get that done. Thank you. All right. Okay. Next we have the revenue forecast. It's Tom for that. Just yeah. Maybe I'll do this too. So I think everybody has a copy of their latest revenue forecast. And uh, this will this will be the staff recommendation uh, this afternoon at uh, two o'clock. And uh, 
Um, everybody goes right to the cartoon. You know. I said, where's the cartoon? <laughs> yeah, that's I got right. charged, but where's the cartoon? Kane was there, so I got <laughs> It's just open. Oh, it's just open. Just okay. open. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief, because some of you have heard parts of this, and some of you will hear more of it later in the rest, but uh, uh, just the thumbnail overview. Uh, economic externals continue to be uh, really positive uh, in terms of revenues. And uh, that is what drove the, um, uh, the, the overage that we saw mostly in April. Uh, it was mostly a personal income event. But there are three really volatile revenue categories that, uh, that are large that can swing enormously in any given year. Uh, corporate income, uh, estate tax income, and personal income. And two of those three this last year did really well. One of them, uh, estate tax, was really bad. It was like 34% below uh, expectations. And that's a miss that you know, is rare even in a really volatile category like that. But we are more heavily reliant on volatile revenue sources like these three big ones than we ever have been before. And uh, in good times, we can really get windfalls. And that sort of, sort of thing happened last year. Uh, and in bad times, that can swing down just as hard. So uh, even though the externals are, are positive right now, uh, it, it bears close watching. Uh, and we're doing this to uh, uh, keep an eye on any early signs of imminent decline. The chart on the very first page shows uh, all the economic recoveries since 1947. And you can see this line on the bottom, which is the current one. Uh, in this month became the longest economic expansion ever. And this goes back to 1854. Um, but what's notable about it is not just this longevity, but the trajectory. If you look at the slope of that line relative to other expansions, it's been the slowest, flattest recovery of any, which at this point in the cycle is actually, ironically, good news. Because it's one of the reasons they're not big imbalances that are obvious right now that would be suggesting a quick end to it. So it still could run farther in part because it hasn't grown as quickly over time. Uh, in the last forecast, on page nine, there's a, a risk matrix that identifies some of the risks that both Moody's Analytics, whose uh, economics forecasts we use, and, um, uh, and administration economists and I have assembled. And in January, one of the most prominent risks was this box here about a Fed policy error that right now is sort of dropped down. That arrow kind of indicates where it might have been in January. And we had built in, so, so the Fed had, had raised interest rates seven times between 2017 and 2018. And they were announcing that they were going to keep going in 2019 uh, as uh, conditions warranted. And the economy had been strengthening and, and baked into that were more interest rate increases. We, th that, that is one of the, the classic ways that recessions start. The, the Fed thinks they're tapping the brakes, and they tap them, and not that much happens, because they're pretty long lags between tapping the brakes and seeing something. And so things keep going up, so they tap them a little harder, and they keep tapping and tapping and tapping. And pretty soon, they've tapped too much, and, and everything cascades down. And, and we had built in a slowing uh, starting in late calendar 20 and 21 uh, into the revenue projections that we had before. The Fed really, between December and February, changed from not just saying there would be increases, they said that they would evaluate it and there might not be any increases. And then uh, about a month or two later said, not only will there not be increases probably, we're actually looking at cutting rates now if need be. And in a couple days, I think you'll see the first such cut. So um, probably 25 basis points, but um, there'll probably be more later. But that's a, 
a powerful change in position, and that actually pulls one of the most likely and most intense factors that could end the, the, the recovery out of, out of contention or diminishes it significantly. And that's the basis for most of the macroeconomic change in the revenue projections that we have. So there are a whole bunch of technical issues and true ups and, and a lot of legislative changes in the, in the last session that are all into this. So lots of moving parts. But just the macroeconomics are probably 20 to 30 million dollars in, in uh, both fiscal 20 and 21 uh, additional, excuse me. And um, the, uh, the complexity of the fund changes and all the accounting on this are such that I'm going to leave it to the Joint Fiscal Office to translate all of this into what it means with respect to the budgets. But basically, there is some additional money. It's not enormous across all three funds. It's probably about 1% of total revenues projected. So that's not you know, earth shaking, but still good that it's positive. And um, you know, un understand that almost all of this, both last year and in the, and in the forecast, are coming from revenue sources that are volatile. And they're volatile because there's a narrow base of payers that are paying very high percentages of, of that. So the question I have, Tom, is what are those non-volatile revenue sources? And maybe we should <laughs> maybe we should get some. <laughs> well, sales and use is a very steady, meals and rooms is a very steady yeah. revenue source. And there have been enhancements mostly through e-commerce to but what are, expand the state, tax rates. I guess Janet and Ann will oh, deal with that. It's income that's so volatile. Yeah, yeah. 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 particularly yeah. at the higher levels. Yeah. Well, sure, and our, and our tax is progressive. There are a couple of charts yeah. that just show that. Yeah, and again, 2017 data yeah. uh, are what we have uh, that, that are, you know, uh, end of year data. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the AGI growth has been in the high end. And from what we know about 2018, it's more of the same. The tax rates are, are quite progressive, so we end up with more revenue as a result. But that's also really volatile. So the effective tax rates higher, but the volatility is increased. So, so other states are not, I'm just like, you're tell, we keep hearing we have volatile. And I was like, well, are other, have other states found the secret to um, provide that stability? Um, well, no, I mean, not all states have an income tax, but, well, you know, yeah, it's, well. it's, <laughs> yeah then, you, then you lose what progressivity that yeah. typically you have. Yeah. So, you know, there are other ways to tax. So things like property taxes are very stable, and, okay. and we okay. get a whole lot of money from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of things. I don't know if the tax uh, commission study is going to have some uh, thoughts on, on what can be done, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's the world we're in with respect to this. So in the state, um, you know, across a wide range of metrics, there's significant improvement. Uh, one of the most timely and detailed at a regional level metric is the unemployment rate. And Vermont, in both May and June, had the lowest unemployment rate in the nation. Uh, what's of interest is that that's percolating down to uh, uh, areas that are typically uh, much worse off. So, uh, uh, you know, the racial disparities nationally in unemployment rates are narrowing. Um, when we look at the state, uh, there's a, a chart of both county level at the U.S. level and then in the state. The, the highest unemployment rate in the state is only 4%. That's in Orleans. You know, and that, that had been uh, double digit at periods of time in the last recession. Um, and uh, there, there's, you know, there, there's a, the longer this lasts, the more improvement it, it causes, even in areas that traditionally have been doing this well. So, uh, so that's really positive. There have been 23,900 jobs created since the low point of this last recession in Vermont. Uh, and uh, you know, that's only about 8% growth from the trough. 
compared to the United States, about double that rate, but uh, there's been a lot more population growth nationally than there has been at the state level. Um, but uh, uh, across a wide range of metrics, the state's doing uh, uh, substantially better, and, and that creates an environment for uh, more tax revenue. I know we've been seeing job growth, but it hadn't translated to wage growth. Are we right. starting to see wage growth? Yeah, yeah. We have not only not only nominal wage growth, but even more important is real wage growth. Yes. So there is a chart. Uh, this is page seven. Yeah. That shows nominal real wage growth. This is this is uh, national data, but it's similar. So the national data for about the past year has been over three percent wage growth, and uh, significantly because inflation hasn't really ticked up, uh, it's been it's been fairly uh, tame. Real wage growth has been between one and two percent. So that that is significant and. Uh, again, that's that's something that the longer the market, the labor market's tight, it's brought in a lot of people from, you know, that are marginally employable, and uh, 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 you know, unemployment rates across age groups are 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 quite low, and uh, so that's uh, that has been happening. That's the quick version. I don't know if you want to. Go into detail. It's about noon now, but uh, if there are questions, I can cover them. There's a lot more, of course, in the in the report, but um, I think that's the 15-minute version. Oh yeah, this is a, this is uh, this is my barcode. Yeah, it's just on the back. Um, it doesn't even color, so. Yeah, it's not even a color, and that's right. to, yeah, and upside down or right side up is sort of same. sort of the same. But what's interesting about this when I, when I was looking at the all the recessions back to 1854, um, it was you know I had the, the the these bars graph. So this is by month of uh, the gray bars are periods where there was an economic downturn. And, uh, and then the yellow areas are areas of expansion. And what you see is, you know, this early period between 1854 and 1929, a phenomenal number of recessions and long duration events. Uh, and the, the notion after the Great Depression uh, that Keynesian economics through uh, deficit spending during times of downturn could offset and, and, and affect uh, the economic cycle is starkly evident here. So you really see how that changes after 1929. Uh, and it was spending around uh, World War II that, that really demonstrated that. But there's also a chart uh, here. Uh, on page 12 that pertains to spending when we're not in a recession, which is what's happening right now. And there's phenomenal deficit spending going on. It's part of the reason the economy is so juiced, um, is uh, the, the enormous fiscal uh, stimulus that's occurring. And uh, that is not typically the right policy prescription when things are going well. And the CBO just came out with a, a very good report on this, looking at, at current law projections of what, what this debt could mean. Uh, very soon, like in the next fiscal year, the interest payments on this debt will exceed the primary debt uh, uh, that the payments are going for. So it's, it's, a, it's a substantial, important issue and one that is getting virtually no attention. But long-term problems um, uh, that could come from this are, are uh, extensive. And CBO lays out some of the possible paths. But they could happen pretty quickly. It's sort of a, uh, you know, when confidence gets lost, there could be a cascading series of events. And we are very much tied into the global economy through this. So much of this debt is held by foreign players. 
and um, inform players that would rather not be supporting the United States in many cases. So, um, you know, there's just, uh, I don't think we've been there before, and that's where you start to get problems, is when there's some new universe of, you know, new reality, and there hasn't been an economic cycle that, uh, that stressed that in the same way. So, anyway, that's a, that's a longer term concern, doesn't even show up in the short term recession things, but it's a, uh, it's not on there because it's not a short term thing, although many of the things on there would be triggered in a big way by this, and a lot of those are, are related. It's more of a long term issue, but I wanted to flag it because it's, it's out there. It's sort of a, a climate change type issue, you know, okay, what's the problem right now? Doesn't feel real hot. Well, it's a little bit hot in here, but um, it's uh, um, you know. But but you can see what's happening, and you can you know. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that's not going to be good. And uh, anyway, it, it it's not on the political horizon of of either party. It doesn't seem like. So, anyway. Okay. Questions. So if there are no more questions. Um, I'll see some of you too. And if there are questions we can cover, I'm happy to do it one on one too. So feel free to call. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. See you too. Yeah. Okay, next is State Auditor Doug Hopper. I know we've got two names, but there's someone you want to talk to. My deputy's here, but he's, okay. he didn't need to write for us. And Emily Bell, yes. And she, no, I assume she was the, the, the bottom of Okay. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me to the record, Doug Hopper. Yeah. I will ask that uh, with your indulgence, uh, two minutes of my time at the end will allow for another very important time-sensitive matter that I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, okay. You, you, you're getting between us and lunch, so. Mine too. <laughs> I'll make it part of the 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we undertook this work to move. They interpret what we did as an interpretation. When in fact, we did no such thing. Gagas audits are backed by work papers that would fill half of this room. There's no statement in that audit that is not supported by a work paper. And the opinions are from the AG. We don't make that stuff. Right. The AG is, is the legal officer of the state. So, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Emily, it. do you want to come back? <laughs> come on up. Uh, we'll go back to okay. cleaning up Lake Champlain. No, you just have to come back after lunch. Because I'm truly No, no. We're, we're finishing up. up. No. We have to go meet the governor at 2 o'clock. So. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. So I can uh, launch in just to a few comments on the audit, but then certainly leave this open for whoever you might like to take questions. So as you are all very aware, this is a very large and complex body of work to both meet the obligations that we are under for the federal orders, the TMDL, the pollution budgets, not just for Lake Champlain, but Lake Mecklenburg and other bodies of water around the state. And we welcome any and all assistance in making sure we've got eyes on the process and that we are both as efficient and as effective as possible. And certainly, our end goal is phosphorus reduction, both within Lake Champlain and all the rivers, lakes, and ponds that drain into Lake Champlain, and that we do so within the time frame that's set by the federal order. So within that, there are a number of different ways in which work is driven, if you like, through this process. Not only do we have the EPA's TMDL, we also have Vermont's own Clean Water Act, Act 64, and now we have the latest Act 76. So in addition to trying to make sure that we're getting the monies on the ground in the most cost-effective way, we have been over the last three years and continue to develop tracking and reporting tools and the science behind those. And with the funds that have gone onto the ground so far, and I appreciate the auditor recognizing it has been an increased amount of capital funds, or now rather a decreased percentage of capital funds, that has led to a number of different, if you like, constraints and forcing mechanisms within the system. So first of all, related to wastewater treatment, 
Act 64 put in place obligations for reissuing permits for the stormwater plants that are in the Lake Champlain Basin. So that is a body of work that has been moving forward. And with those, as you can imagine, there are multiple different stages to these projects. So the point at which we're actually able to and account for the phosphorus which has been reduced by a project is not when it comes in for initial feasibility, not when it comes in for design, but when we finally actually have a project so, built. Um, can I ask a question? So let's take Lake Champlain and yes. use that stormwater um, and wastewater treatment. I think off the top of my head, 60% of Vermont falls within that um, uh, Lake Champlain Basin. Yes. So if you're saying any wastewater project within it, I mean, part of what we struggled with was a relatively small part of money. How do we make sure that our first projects out are the ones that give us the, the low hanging fruit, so to speak, in terms of making identifiable, measurable progress? So I, I'm just a little concerned. Maybe I misunderstood, but if we basically said we're going to uh, fund any wastewater project within Lake Champlain Basin, um, and that's a pretty uh, wide door. No, so in fact, it's those that are driven by the regulations, so by permit obligation. So both within... Is that a wide door? I haven't got an idea. Is that small? So what? Let's, let's take the example of stormwater and developed lands, because that's an area where we have a substantial reduction we need to get from the developed land sector, and it's also a place where we've got a lot of regulatory obligations at the same time. So Act 64 for stormwater um, advanced the jurisdiction of stormwater permitting. So this means that any three acre parcels that are currently built that have three acres of impervious surface are now coming under a stormwater permit. And in addition, in working with the legislature, we dropped the threshold for new developments from a half acre, from one acre to half an acre. So that's an example where regulation is driving the timing of projects. So it's not kind of at choice that either private or public entities would be coming in and starting off the process of doing a stormwater or a wastewater treatment plant, but there are regulatory triggers that have been occurring in the early years. So if I could just kind of like, I just want to add on to this, Senator Kitchell, with a couple of the other drivers. So with any of the funds that we have, within the capital funds there are other drivers. And within the more flexible funds, there's some similar drivers. So with the capital funds, we also count in here some of the state revolving funds. So in the Clean Water State Revolving Funds and the Municipal Pollution Control Grants, both of which have a phosphorus impact, so we count them in here, each of those has their own project prioritization and readiness process. And for all the flexible funds that we have, we have stood up over the last few years a number of the granting programs. You might have heard these under the, the banner of QUIP or ERP, the Ecosystem Restoration Grants. So with each of those, we put competitive grant rams out. So with that, what it means is the projects that are at a stage of readiness, and so once we have those projects that come in for a competitive grant round, we pick the best projects that come in at that point in time. But there is like a project staging of build. So from the day that Act 64 was passed, from the day we were under the EPL TMD obligations, all of the projects we have to complete over the next 20 years were not ready to go. So you couldn't just kind of choice pick the most efficient projects off the bat, because it can take a number of years to stand up any one of these projects, whether it's driven regulatorily, which tends to be the stormwater and the wastewater, or whether they're the additional natural resource projects. Okay, I, I think I, this is interesting, but I'm not sure that it's a problem we're going to solve today. Mm -hmm. I think the message, and I, we understand there's reasons using capital money, but that it doesn't have the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, in reducing phosphorus necessarily. You are going to be doing a phosphorus assessment inventory. Okay. So, all the different project types. Yes. There are various um, proven scientific methods to evaluate phosphorus. For some, others are under development. 
So for an individual stormwater practice, for example, the science determining what is the anticipated fossil production for a practice is there. Right. If you have a look at, for example, investments in combined sewer systems in a town, where you might be separating out some of the sewer and the stormwater, you then need to have a look at each of those individual and unique situations and then you want to have. So that, that just makes yeah, you know, I think we're getting too far into the meetings, yeah. though, on this one. It's yeah. not yeah. something that can't wait until January <laughs> to make it change. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we got the message that part of, you know, is because of restrictions on the money and readiness and a whole lot of other things. I think this was just a report. And I know we've got a couple other reports coming that may be more controversial. Um, and we just had the TIF one dropped on us. So um, I think unless we have any specific questions that we might want to wrap this up, can I just make two very quick references? Yep. One is obviously to Act 76 that was passed by this body in, uh, in May, June. And so that actually represents a very substantial shift in our yes. delivery. So that's going to be a very important body of work for us to come back to the legislature over the next two or three years as we're standing on this system and looking at how that really does create a system by which the phosphorus reductions of a project are the primary driver. A clean water service provider will be allocating the phosphorus load for a watershed. They will have an amount of funding to accomplish that phosphorus load. And so built into this system now, and these again are for the non-regulatory projects, is a, com a, a compulsion, I'll call it that, to actually go after the best phosphorus reduction targets. So when we have the regulatory schemes moving ahead, we have the new three-acre permit that's stood up for stormwater. We continue to make advances in working through the repermitting of wastewater facilities. And with this, you're seeing a lot of <coughs> capacity come into the system, coupled with some very significant investments over the next couple of years to make sure that we've got the science, for example, for floodplain foster reduction okay. and other things. OK, thank you. OK, thank yes. you. All right. I want to get on to the cor correctional facility assessment. And we have the <coughs> memo, and Mary, you're here to talk to us about that. And is anyone going to queue this up for us? I understand. Mary, 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 Mary Cat. Okay. Yeah. But the basic issue is the law says that joint correctional oversight has to approve this, and then joint fiscal yeah. has to approve it. Okay. So, and maybe you can start by telling us what it is. Okay, so this year's capital bill said, as you suggested, that mm -hmm. the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, which was the Corrections Correct. Oversight Committee. Right. I was saying justice and yes. said, no, that's corrections. All yeah. right, you yeah. changed it. Yeah. Um, it needs to look at this and then make a recommendation to this committee. And that recommendation is attached. It's in, so we have documents in our package. I think it's the last document. It's labeled G. It's a memo from Jackson <coughs> to us. And the recommendation from the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee is attachment B, number on page three. And what this suggests is essentially per the capital bill and the discussions of the legislative the justice oversight committee that the funding to go ahead to begin the very initial stages of how do we move forward forward with replacement of uh, failing correctional facilities is that some work be done by BGS and they suggested some um, restrictions on how this work can be done, and that's described in um, attachment B. It's being necessitated by in the view, and I can speak for the House um, uh, Institutions and Corrections Committee, by what I said a moment ago is failure of some of our um, correctional facilities. They are just really on their last legs. 
We had an instance in, um, in the past year where they had to shut the kitchen down in the St. Albans facility because of a roof failure. They couldn't use it. Um, the facility in South Burlington has had kind of similar, really fundamental problems. Okay, so and this you, isn't just about, because I... It's a very well, we had a discussion. And general analysis of what is it going to take forward to cite something somewhere. And then okay, we talk it isn't about just about a new women's facility, because that was the kind of impression I got when we had our phone briefing on today. So it's Good. not that. So the women's facility, which is the South Burlington right. facility, is probably at the top of the list of the facilities that need to be replaced, but they're followed pretty rapidly by um, the one in St. Albans and Rutland and kind of go around the state and have problems with each of them. So there's a, a view that we need to replace facilities and you need to kind of understand what the scope of the problem is, not we're going to replace the woman's facility or we're going to replace St. Albans or we're going to build something of a certain size, but just trying to begin to get your arms around what the potential siting needs are, the potential costs, some of the administrative issues, and trying to just kind of go into this on the first level so that future legislatures can make decisions about how this would work. I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, understanding the, the scope of work here. We all know that our old mm -hmm. um, regional correctional facilities, mm -hmm. their design, actually we replicated some of the same thing when we did the psychiatric hospital, but the way that they're designed, very staff and uh, uh, costly. Um, so, and we know that there are hundreds of, several hundred million dollars of capital mm -hmm. uh, needs. So. Uh, uh, is this analysis to look at our population, both male and female? Uh, what would be the capacity? What would be the recommended size of a facility to get the most efficient um, staffing as well as programmatic services? We heard, obviously, our correctional health care costs are mm -hmm. higher because high. of this yeah. you know, community. So yeah. I, I, it's like, I don't know how you build something until you determine for whom uh, for what size, uh, what, you know, what the component pieces. So is this to really help do that first analysis that, to me, uh, um, isn't a bricks and mortar. It's really that um, uh, uh, taking that, um, uh, creating that policy context, establishing the, uh, getting the data and the numbers and the, um, and the population uh, needs yeah and level of security, and then that would determine what number of facilities right. for whom. I mean, the, so I'm, that's what I'm struggling with, Mary. I'm sorry. I, I appreciate um, that. And I think that's something that we're all struggling with. Um, and I think that the answer from, again, at least the House Institutions Committee, and this is the testimony that we heard in Joint Justice, oversight is essentially because it takes so long to figure out where, where to build something and how, so siting, you know, but what getting some designs, but, but hang on. Mm -hmm. So that we're gonna do a parallel process. And you'll see that in this, um, the proposal from the Justice Oversight Committee, it specifically references the work that we're having the Council of State Governments do on, do for us, and that, that that study will help inform this process going forward. So it's a parallel process, and it's because, again, come back to failing facilities that, you know, we, we actually, and maybe Senator Ash remembers this, in the last session of the Justice Oversight Committee, had a discussion, a fairly long discussion, about facilities and what should we be doing. We never really got off the dime. And there's this notion that we need to, we need to push this ahead. So it's a parallel process. I think it's absolutely intended to inform the decision made, that, that the 
the number of folks who are incarcerated, the type of people who are incarcerated, the reduction and the numbers that will all be part of this, of the end decision, but that we're, we're counting on the Council of State Governments to help us with that thought making process, but at the same time, there is, a, there is a notion that we need to begin figuring out some of these other, just like how do you build it? And, and some of those questions are regardless of is it a man or a woman, is it, you know, the type of offense, et cetera. It is just, you know, what sizes the box, essentially. Okay. Represent. I, I just have a question about the shells, because we don't know what the Council of State Government is going to bring back, and that we shall accommodate for those results. So if their results are, in, if they conflict with three and four, how can we already determine three and four when we don't know the recommendation from number two and they're all shells? So they, they may say, you know, do small facilities, you know, that are medium security with those sizes, or they may say one facility of a larger size and then it doesn't accommodate for number two because three and four, they're in, con in my mind, they're con they conflict with one another. So I think there was they a could. strong right. feeling that we wanted any of the work that BGS is doing to be informed by the um, Council of State Governments study. Mm -hmm. So that's the shall on number two. Um, on number three, the, I think there is a view that in the past we have built facilities in general to a very specific population need that is not flexible enough to meet whatever um, the population needs are. That, and we heard this from the Department of Corrections, that they believe that it's necessary for it to be a medium security facility. That we are always going to have, we, we don't have any high security in the state. We, we ship all of those people out of state. Those handle, very and small that will handle. continue to be our policy? Yeah. Well, uh, so, well, so that's an interesting question. And I think discussion. it is a big discussion. Um, but medium security, so the shall around the medium security is a way to attain the highest degree of flexibility possible with these facilities. What the Department of Corrections will tell you today is, is they currently I think it's about 10% of their beds are not being used, which means that those 10% of unused beds are not accommodating people who are out of state. They could be brought in because those beds are not flexible enough in their use. And so the, the view is a medium um, facility is the most flexible facility that you can get and still kind of meet overall goals of the state. I am confusing you. But, well, yeah. the, part of it is, I read some place, it was like a 50, it was like yeah. three different sizes, and yeah. then there was a limit yeah. on 200. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. a policy uh, decision. Uh, right. That it's creating a constraint on if, if if someone came back and said the optimum size for the most efficient pop, for this population is 350, mm -hmm. and that'll give you better health care, it'll give you better education, it'll get you yeah. better support. <coughs> then yeah. we basically have predetermined in advance of the analysis what what is the most uh, most. Uh, effective in terms of security, staffing, and also the kinds of services that our, our uh, inmates would need. That's, uh, yeah. that's why um, I believe one way to think it. about the sizing is think about them essentially as modules that you could add on. So it's saying it won't be any more than 200 maximum that they're going to consider the design for. But it could be more than that on a particular site. Yes. I mean, we all have some very large tracts of land. Yeah. So in, in, interestingly, this memo initially said it won't be more than 800 beds. And the discussion at the Justice Oversight Committee said, no, bring it down to no more than 200 beds. Um, because, again, there, so there's this interesting tension 
because we know healthcare costs and management and administration costs, one large facility is much, much um, less expensive to run per person. But we also have rather strong feelings about um, large centralized facilities. And that's going to be a policy commit question this bodies, these bodies are going to have to answer going forward. None of what BGS is proposing to do will limit those choices going, none of what we're asking BGS to do will limit those choices going forward. It will give us sufficient information to understand kind of how those building blocks will fit together and what the potential costs are of that. Any clarification? But did you have a question no, before? I, I guess I was just going to comment that that's not the way the words read to me. What okay. you're saying makes some sense. What mm -hmm. I read here sounds very um, much more prescriptive and smaller. Yeah. So uh, that's why that's why we're yeah. not understanding what you're saying mm -hmm. is because we're looking at this, this at the yeah. same time. Yeah. And I think this is the tension between kind of wanting to get data and being a little bit concerned about the consequence of some of that data. So, so my question is exactly that. So did you, did you say, Mary, that um, this, there could be a larger campus where individual buildings for certain types of you know, uh, women or men or different geriatric. security levels, geriatric, uh, could be on a campus, but in one pod there could be no more than 200 beds, but there could be several pods on a campus? That is certainly the way I have imagined this could work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure this says that, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you think that um, understanding is shared by everybody on the, whatever committee this is? Joint Justice, Justice Oversight? Oversight? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I was not at the discussion for um, when I, I, I actually was there, was part of the writing yeah. of this. And I know they wanted their shells, but I wasn't there when they actually said, yes, we voted on this. But they did vote in favor of this. They, they believe that it is important to go ahead with the um, release of this funding, because we are going to be sitting here in another year saying, we don't have enough data to be making these decisions, and we have people out of state because we can't bring them back in because we don't have the beds for them. OK. I, I, I just like to say that the sequential approach versus the parallel approach strikes me as a fundamental question. And I totally respect mm -hmm. everything you've said speaks to the reason why nothing's changed. Right. And that they would be planning for things without having the CSG work complete, to me, signals that we'll find ourselves in the thing we're trying to avoid anyways, which is after we get these sort of pod and the different style uh, assessments, then we're going to have the CSG thing come, and then we're going to have to revisit all the things that BGS has told us in order to take what we've learned and then because it's not going to be like they can talk in real time as the work's being done. It's going to be more like we, this council state government process is going to work its way and then produce a you know, report of some kind. So I don't want to second guess the committee. It, it, it thought about this at a greater length than, than we have here. But I think it's pretty likely that we're going to find ourselves facing the same timing problem and then revisiting and wondering what we got for the 200. And there, there is an expectation that CSG will be talking with CGS and that they will, there will be communication back and forth so that they're understanding what those needs are. And, and I, is BGS going to hire a consultant? It seems I, to me this is, this, is, this is much more than designing a facility. It's, it's really looking at a variety of options. It seems like you need a structured analysis of the advantages, disadvantages, what are the cost implications for the different choices for legislators to ultimately make um, you know, good decisions. So um, I'm just wondering how BGS uh, I don't see this as an engineering or a design issue uh, as much as I see the um, um, an, uh, analysis of the 
inmate characteristics and needs and, and so forth. So, and, and what we have for different options and, and sometimes we, our perceptions are, you know, not to necessarily uh, bear out in reality. So, um, I, I'm just wondering, is BGS, so BGS uh, hiring somebody to, to do the this? Or is BGS is or here. Is the yeah. commissioner going to yeah. do this yeah. analysis? Yeah. Yeah. That was going to be state party. Would you just do stay back there? I think my concern in all of this is it says that BGS will work with the council of state governments and, you know, they'll be communicating. But I can see the council of state governments coming in and saying, you've got to build one great no. big, right. no, they or whatever they come in so with. If they come in with something, it would not be unheard of for us to say, yeah, we agree with everything you like. But we still want to have, a, you know, something else. In the meantime, we've done a study based on a study that we haven't seen or agreed to what, yet. What we're asking the Council of State Governments to do is to help us figure out how to reduce the population. We have diversion. It, it is, okay. and, and we so have some very good different. ideas for what need to be done. But C, CGS, CSG. CSG is going to help us think through that. Regardless of how we address our numbers, we still have facility needs that have to be addressed. And rather than waiting to find out if we're going to have, what, we have 1,600 people incarcerated in state today, and rather than waiting to figure out if we're going to have 14 or 10 or, you know, 1,000, Let's begin the process of figuring out, because we know we have to replace those facilities. Let's begin the process. So that's okay. the parallel. Of getting path. an estimate as to the, C the cost of the heat of the plant, the septic exactly. system, exactly. the acreage required, mm -hmm. I assume, if we do one big or we do pods. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. That's and, what I think has not been clear. And then the last yeah. thing, if I may, we have an, it, or the JFO staff received an email from Senator Sears last night when he said he couldn't come right. and that he supported this. Yes. I just wanted to make that's, sure that that's all, all the members knew that. Yeah. Do yeah. we have to take action today? I mean, yes. I would really, Otherwise, I, I feel it's right the on comments. your head, Mary, to Sorry. you know present this. Um, you know, recommendation and, and these questions are. We could take it till September. I was just wondering whether. So the problem with a... tabling it is that the amount of time that it takes, BGS is going to. Um, um, it's not BGS staff. They're going to have to hire folks, so they're going to have to go through an RFP process, which is talked about here. Um, and so tabling it pushes it off for a couple more months. The House Capital Institutions Committee was hoping that it would be able to put this into its budget proposal, and the timing won't work. So we will, if you, if you push it off for a couple months. So if we push months, it off, they will not will have the time to we'll do an RFP okay. to be able to budget to the, the work out to the study yeah. in the capital well, budget. Well, it, it, does, it does strike me. I mean, I. I your explanation is more helpful. It's helpful mm -hmm. in understanding what CSG, and I'm familiar mm -hmm. with what we've done before in terms of recidivism, trying yeah. to reduce yeah. recidivism, mm -hmm. reduce the number of Vermonters incarcerated, et cetera. So they, they're, they're a great resource on that. But So that's helpful just to remind myself that's what this is talking about, not facility design, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. But, it just, but is there anything that would keep BGS from beginning the work on a draft RFP that is going to be do not is due at August 29th, and we're going to meet on September 17th. It's like that seems to me like there's nothing that they need two hundred thousand dollars for to do the draft RFP. I would have agreed with you, but their testimony at the oversight committee meeting was very clear that they would not begin drafting an RFP until the money was released. I think on that we're going to have the commissioner and yeah. and and we need rather to than me saying what I thought he said. What he says yeah. he's being asked to do and what his time frame is. 
for the record, Chris Cole, Commissioner of Buildings and General Services. So in terms of the time frame, we're already up against it. I doubt we'll be able to meet the March 31st deadline. It takes us more than 30 days to draft an RFP. So right now, the language that was approved by the Joint Oversight Committee, uh, which I did not attend, um, has us presenting it to this committee on August 29th. I doubt we'll be able to. No, I think it's to the oversight. Well, to the oversight. Yeah. To the oversight. No, right. yeah. And then it's got to come back. So, so two issues there. Not sure I can meet that deadline. And number two, I'm not sure what the review is going to be regarding the RFP. We generally aren't used to having the legislative branch review executive branch RFPs that you ask us to go out with a goal in mind to review a policy objection or a policy issue. So that's just something to discuss. Struggling with that language and policies. Can you please? Um, that would be helpful. Thank you. 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 Thank so the Council of State Governance is going to finish their study December 31st. There is a large part that we need to review in terms of their recommendations to you folks. They're going to be talking about incarceration levels, as you mentioned, and what other states do and what are other programs and policies. That's going to inform us as to what we develop. Um, I, I was there for the testimony in the House. I was there for the testimony at the Joint Oversight. While it may not say one's correctional facility, that's what, from our perspective, based on the testimony, is what this is all about. And, it, and it's because of the, and, and you should know that the correctional facility in Chittenden County is not one of our worst correctional facilities in terms of condition. It's just not being used as it was designed. And it doesn't have space. It's in a really congested area of South Burlington. It doesn't have space to expand to offer the types of programming for inmates that we would want to offer. And so in, in large part, it's about building what is an appropriate replacement for the women's facility. And this is why you see the numbers 50, 100, and 175. The 175 is a recommendation by DOC as to what they would like based on the number of, of inmates they have. And the 50, 100 are numbers that are just scalable that we could go down in size um, for that type of facility. And it says the facility shall not be an assessment of more than 200 beds. Uh, the facility in northwestern Vermont is 350, so we already have experience with what um, that costs. Um, you know, when you're getting into larger facilities, I think there is a magic number with a standalone facility. I don't know what that number is in terms of optimization and efficiency. I think we don't know what that number is, but I do think there is a number out there. Um, the committee was not um, um, supportive of, the large. of a larger uh, campus-like facility, which we believe brings the greatest number of operational facilities, but that has not been in the Vermont historic experience. So it's, it's kind of an outlier for all of us as okay. to what would that look like, how would it operate, and does it deliver, deliver the type of quality that most people associate with a smaller, um, centrally operated or uh, standalone facility. So um, I don't know how much, I can't really tell you how much of this work will be of value to the state until we see the work that comes from the Council on State Governments and how will they, they mesh. Can I get a clarification? Because I'm, I'm hearing that this is really focused on the women's facility and I'm hearing that it's not. It's not. Now I yeah. think I'm hearing that it is. And um, so my question is, is it? Um, and is the Council of State Governments focused on uh, both men and women, or is it focused on women? I, I just, I, I keep going back and forth in terms of what I'm being told. So the commissioner wouldn't know the answer to the CSG no. question. Um, and it is my understanding that the council and state government's work is at reducing the overall population, not specifically on women's. Yes, we have been focused on the flaws with locating women in where they are currently located, which is the reason there has been this discussion about women. But it's been very clearly stated in the committee hearings that I've attended that this is about 
again, not a, for a specific population of people, but generally trying to understand the overall costs of it, it, when, you the way. when you use the word this, you're talking about the, council of state government, no, so I'm you're sorry. talking about the buildings and general the, the, services. The buildings and general services okay. work. So. That, if I can just add to that. I just heard you say women, so. Okay. I do. Thank you. The cost of the facility, so facilities exist to support programs. And until you know what the program is, you can't adequately design or cost estimate what the one-time capital cost would be to build it. And so, you know, we can, we can, we already know what it costs to build correction facilities, you know, in terms of a, by a square foot number. It's, it, the question becomes the add-ons, you know, beyond that, you know, or do you have trauma um, supported rehabilitation, you know, in your correction facility? Do you have, what are the different programs? What is the drug treatment program you have? What is the educational program you have? What is the worker training program you have? What are the transitional programs back to community you have? All of these programming pro informs your design. And until we know that, what CSG is recommending in terms of programs for whatever types of facilities and population we're talking about, it's difficult for us um, to do that. We can, we can do the commissary. We can do the beds. We can do the recreational space you know, all, all the other stuff. But the CSG program, where you're looking at a variety of different policies that the legislature could enact in terms of reducing our inmate size, um, directly correlates to the work that we'll be doing. So I, I can't give you any assurances um, the value of, of this exercise when they're running concurrently side by side. And I do understand that there's a desire to get moving on this. Did, BG, did BGS express that at the, no, I know you said you weren't there, but did anyone at BGS say it quite the way you just put it at the Joint Justice Committee meeting in terms of the challenges that you guys would face to we do the job the way you would typically do it and encompassing the programming as well as some of the sort of basic physical needs? We've been trying to thread a needle supporting the legislature in their efforts to get this information. We'll study whatever you would like to study. Um, it's just been challenging for us because the ball does seem to be moving between a women's facility or a general facility. And it seems now that the desire of the legislature is on a general facility uh, study in terms of those, those costs. And you know, your biggest cost in a facility is choosing your site. You know, if you don't choose a good site, you have a lot of work to do to get that site ready to house your facility. So that's that's really critical. And this study isn't going to um, do that. It, it's going to pick out the elements of what a good site looks like. But we already know all that. Um, so in answer to your question, probably not in this level of specificity and detail. We've been really trying to cooperate and get along and trying to achieve the the goals and where this started out from, which was in the House Corrections and Institutions Committee. So if, if I may, if, so this has been discussed by the Justice Oversight Committee twice. And you and I were at the first time yes. that this was discussed. And yes, this I my recollection is that we had this specific conversation about, and, and it has been difficult. I, I, my interpretation has been that BGS has not been particularly, this would not have been your chosen path uh, for how to do this. It was the chosen path, path of the capital bill, which is where this came from. So it was the chosen path of these bodies. We had this conversation about how to run these two processes parallel. And, and this was the attempt to continue to kind of thread that needle. And, and I just come back to the concern of got to get off the dime. Something needs to be done. Um, and this was a way to try to push both to push the construction of a facility to meet our needs forward while trying to understand what the policy issues are that we need to be addressing, which CSG is going to help us do. Thus the parallel. I'm, I'm watching the time, and I, 
We've got a lot of questions. I don't yeah. think we're going to get any better answers than we have at this point. And I'm just wondering if this committee feels ready to move forward or do we want to table this until September, at which point Justice Oversight will have a chance to meet and knowing our concerns, which it, I think boils down to we haven't seen what CSG is going to recommend. We don't know what the program is. We're going to be building a facility to house. Um, and until we do, we're kind of wasting time. Do You already know a square footage to do some cement walls and floors and you know, living in pot kinds of things that we've done before. So why spend money until we know what, what fine tuning we want on that and where we want it? Do we want it in central Vermont? Do we want to go back up to the kingdom where land tends to be cheaper? Do we want to go you know, do we want one, two, or three? Um, I think that's what we haven't really answered. So, committee, I'm looking for a motion or another question. All right, I'll put it out there. I make a motion. We accept this and get off the dime and get it going. Okay. So, Representative Fagan has moved, I believe, the official wording. Should I read the text? I will edit you. Thank you. That's stated in attachment page. Yes. Yeah, there you go. All right. So. Oh, well, I was just, before the motion was made, but I'll make it this comment subsequent to the motion. What I hear from the commissioner of BGS is that they do not need $200,000 to come up with the answers to the questions, uh, that they already have the information about generally building a correctional facility uh, and size. And so um, if we support this, uh, I don't understand why they would spend $200,000. Uh, the testimony I heard today is that they already have the information. Uh, I'm happy to support the um, BGS going forward and providing the information. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly a little bit confused uh, as to why. I mean, I agree we need to get off the dime, but the testimony that the commissioner appears to be providing is that they don't need $200,000 to do the assessment that is being asked for. And I think what we are essentially, we're being asked to do this because so we've got $200,000 attached. It. So we, if we approve it, we are approving the spending of $200,000. Uh, I'm confused. So is that a, is that an accurate assessment? I don't represent? believe I testified that. BGS didn't need the funds to, to do the study. What I testified is we already know the square foot currently of what it takes to build a correction facility. But until we understand from council and state governments what a modern correctional facility looks like with all its programming and in terms of its space, I know the state of Maine just built a new correctional facility expressly for women, and it's a very innovative and progressive and policy forward leaning uh, design, which is completely different than what we build here in the state of Vermont. And so in order to educate ourselves, because we are not familiar, and nor do we have project managers that design those types of facilities, we would need to hire a consultant who would need to detail best practices in terms of programming and facilities that would hopefully, and this is the hope, line up with Council and state government's work, and that we're not too far off the mark, and we've educated ourselves and can give costings. I know how to build it, and the costs associated with the bare bones correctional facility and detention facility, not the type of policy and, and rehabilitation facilities which, you know, differ than what correctional facilities. Maybe we should give them 200000 to the Department of Corrections to make these policy, I, I feel like you need to have the, that policy framework 
or those decisions in order to know what you need to build. Yeah. So I don't know, perhaps we're tasking BGS to do that policy work that legitimately should be undertaken by the agency and the Department of Corrections. I've never had BGS. I would not want BGS to say this is the kind of programming that we think is the most uh, effective and um, uh, state of the art um, for a particular group of inmates, but maybe you want to morph into that role, but it seems to me normally the administering department outlines what it is for the building's needs and specifications. So I think that's what we're struggling with is uh, the role that BGS is being um, given here, and that's why we're, uh, so that's why I'm having a hard time. If I may be it, it was never the intention to ask BGS to do any work on programming and, and that sort of understanding. It was simply to understand, you know, kind of the shell of a building and the site, at, and the, and the site sort of questions. You all clearly have more questions than, than you're, you're comfortable voting one way or another on. I think we did hear the commissioner say, that even in this time frame, given the current wording, which asks for an RFP to be submitted to the justice oversight, he can't meet that. So we're already slipping the deadlines. I, I, I'm hoping JFO is listening to this hard so that we can have a conversation with the justice oversight committee at their next meeting and come back to this, the original motion. Of, so so Representative Fink is here. I don't, I don't want to vote on your motion because I don't want to kill that's, it. That's um, kind, of, that's kind I, of where I'm going. I'm not ready to vote to what, say what yes. I, what, I'm hoping I know that's what Yeah, so, so, so I, I'm going to begrudgingly recommend that we that I withdraw my motion. Mm -hmm. I'm going to begrudgingly gonna withdraw my motion. Okay. Um, in the, in my concern here, and I did reach out to Butch Shaw and uh, Representative Shaw, and I had a discussion with him, and, the, and, and while I didn't get into specific questions about this, um, he, it was very clear that, that the discussion that went on at the committee meetings was very beneficial and that they really wanted to get going with this instead of continuing, as I've termed it, chasing ourselves around a pole, just trying to answer questions, and, and et cetera. Um, my concern right now, and I am going to withdraw the motion, but my concern is that we're, now we're into the next legislative session, and we may not finish the work that this entails in time to be able to affect anything at the next legislative session. But just, just you know, and that's the reason why I'm begrudging the withdrawal. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, I understand that. I understand that. But certainly, the further we kick the can down the road, the more apt we are to lose the ability to take action. Can I get another motion? So. I'll move that we defer um, action until the September meeting. meeting. I think in the meantime, it would be very helpful if we got a clear understanding of the work CSG is going to do. Because I don't think they get into the facility um, 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 details that we perhaps, some people might think. I think we need to be, I think they're more in terms of how you uh, reduce the population, what are effective yes. strategies. So I think that would be helpful to get some clarity around what that product would be. Um, so I'll make the motion that we um, uh, defer our action um, until the September. Sandy Kitchell, can I get a second? No, second. Okay. Sandy Kitchell has moved and so has seconded that we defer action on, not, these don't have numbers, number G until our September meeting. Um, further discussion is not. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say aye. no. Okay, that motion carries. And Steve, talk about being between us and lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me just go ahead. I was just sorry. Excuse me. Just jump in yep. we go to Steve's report. Um, I just want to make sure, get some clarity on what we decided to do with the Dexy issue um, before we close out while we're all still sitting We're writing here. a letter. Did we 
um, who leads the we, and do we vote on doing that, and when is that going to get done, and how? Um, I'm, I'm just a little unsure if we did. I hope it's really important that we uh, weigh in on this, but I don't want to just Senator leave it. Um, I'll, uh, um, so we hadn't actually taken an action, but I think we talked should. about taking one. I think one. so. Uh, there's really two approaches we could take, as I see it. One would be to write a, write a letter from the committee or authorize the yeah. chair to write it, or to uh, have the chair contact the attorney general's office asking them to intervene or uh, or, or do both. Um, my own view at this moment is that um, I think the attorney general's office should be the one who does it. But that's my view, and it's because we're going to be back dealing with the wrinkles around TIF legislation like we do every year, trying to customize, especially now that more communities are doing it. So I'm not going to make the motion, but I view those as the two choices. So um, I, I think that, um, so I, I would um, think it makes more sense for this committee to weigh in um, rather than the Attorney General. I mean, if the Attorney General weighs in, it's just a lawyer arguing against another lawyer. Um, and as the chair of a committee that deals with TIF, I have some real concerns about the, about the way this issue is being handled and being addressed. And so I don't, I don't mind writing a letter. No, I'm I, happy to have yeah, the, the I, money chairs could write a letter. I think it would be important this that the should. letter come from me since I've probably been the biggest supporter of TIFs in at least the Senate. I know you and I aren't generally on the same page on it. Um, and so I think that a letter coming out with my name on it somewhere as head of, of this committee would be. But on behalf more, of the committee. On behalf of the committee. Of the committee. But to say you're risking your biggest supporter because on this is, is concerning. Uh, so is it appropriate to make a motion that, the, yes. that we um, authorize the chair to write a letter um, on the two issues um, on behalf of the Pepsi committee. Okay. Second. That a mo that's a motion. Yes. Okay. Motion. Senator Ansel has moved that the which representative. That's true. Um, it's struck the chair <laughs> to write a letter on behalf of the committee um, requesting that Pepsi not postpone that perhaps he postponed action on informing municipalities given the joint lack of clarity on the legal lack of clarity yeah. on the legal until the legislature is able to okay. meet and weigh in and provide clarity. Okay. You got that, Steve. <laughs> Good. We'll work with you on <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really okay. Thank you. I just felt like yeah. it was okay. Yeah. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay. okay. Um, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to just say people have asked, what does this the revenue forecast mean for the budget? I just wanted to, the number we as we had a fifty one million dollar surplus in FY nineteen, we talked about that. In FY twenty there was a language in the bill that said if the surplus exceeded $20 million for that year, then the additional amount would go to the state teacher joke head. The surplus came in at $18.4 million, so there will be nothing going forward other than just money available to budget against the needs. So is there some place where the actual forecast is telegraphed? Yeah, it's not in the document. Yeah, it, actually there was a, I think a sheet sent out on a, an operating statement. Um, did we send that out? The one page sheet? My chair's got it. Okay, we should send it out and we'll both send it out. Because I didn't really understand. I saw Tim's yeah. charts and his wonderful cartoons, but I had no idea what was happening today. No, but the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. he didn't say the bottom line today. And yeah, I'm and, yeah, I think it, that. And so, what, what and that, that was sent out probably, um, and we'll be accepted at the e board, but. Uh, what but Tom's meeting for? Not everyone, Tom's meeting. Not everyone here yeah. Yeah. sits at the e board, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. so we will definitely send out the operating payment and say we're calculating the FY. Uh, it would also be helpful if you put so in that anticipate what we anticipated, but in fact is going to be the yep. um, revenue upgrade, how much of it was sort of right. anticipated to support um, right. the obligation of right. funds to the clean water. Because people. Yeah. 
have to remember that that yes, we borrowed that and saved that. And that's so, and we do have a sheet to lay that out for FY20. Well, if we don't get it in 42, we can't encourage or discourage yes. our respective members to vote yes or no on the We will maybe, that. Stephanie, can you get, send that sheet out? Like, yeah, we have it all done and sent right out now to all the members. Um, the FY21 is a little more confusing. Uh, on the available general fund, we're up about 28 million or 1.7%. Uh, the problem is that since a lot of what we passed were um, uh, fees that don't show up in the general fund, we're still trying to work with the administration to sort of net out that and figure out how it, where it really ends up. But um, they, they turn into direct apps. They don't. They don't. Yeah. Mean they don't show up in so they Even though they're revenues are revenues, but yeah. 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 It's something we actually should consider over time because a lot of the direct apps is considered revenue. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'm not clear why they don't. But that's a technical yeah. thing, I guess. It's a technical thing. Yeah. It's something we probably should look It's revenue. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. And we have a we lot of. It. Um, <laughs> yeah. We only yeah. spend revenue. And so that is something to think about how much revenue comes in, not through the available revenues. And we, we may want to propose something in the, over the next year to look at that. Um, yeah, so that's, so we're, you know, the raw numbers are sort of net. The 18.4 will send out right away. The um, 28 million or so is still being worked on for the next year. And since our budget is about 1.6 billion, it's about, you know, 1.7 percent growth. And uh, that's assuming we don't spend more this year on base. Expenditures. So it's not, um, given our, our usual cost pressures, there still is going to be a gap, a uh, pretty sizable gap, probably in the 40 to 60 range, and maybe more. And that's what we're going to work on in the next uh, few weeks. Just a couple other quick things I'm going to make. Um, we're going to send a notice to all of you. Uh, I think there's a, actually, it was a reference to my fiscal office report. The tax commission has just done a report on demographics, which is really interesting if you have a chance to read it. It's, uh, we'll send out just a sole link. I know it's part of my report and there's a link in that, but I'll, um, we can send that out again. Uh, the other thing is with the federal, you know, this new federal agreement that's being done now about spending in the last two years not being as draconian as was originally planned, one of the things we're thinking about is to really look at what we should be telling our congressional delegation about needs that we have, because there is some more money to play with than, than probably there was before. And I think it, it may be something we work with the administration on and try to think about what type of guidance. And I know we're losing the, um, um, the enhanced match, and you know that would be an example. But are there sort of things that we should advise them on that are important for um, on federal funds. It's just a thought we're playing with. Um, haven't done anything on that yet. Um, but I think we might have an opportunity and that they're all going to be building a budget with a different boundary than they had before. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's it. We're trying to show this flag. Room, we haven't heard the exact number of, instead of seven and a half percent, I think they're probably closer to six percent return this year. So that will downwardly affect um, that will be, work, be worked out in the uh, uh, actuaries report. But there is quick pressure on the system. Those are the main, I don't know if there are any particular things in the report that you all want me to focus on. Questions for Steve. We still have coal in the Fed fund. Oh, that's right. And we were going to have Chloe tell you about the Fed fund. Yes. Uh, Chloe, you want to take a couple minutes on that? Or? Sure. Oh, wow. Really that's right. We need the fortification really before we take over this. Uh, okay. <laughs> what is it? Um, the actual revenues for FY19 came in, and the education fund was, the revenues were pretty much as estimated, so that year looks good. Um, we did see a significant downgrade in the sales tax for FY20. So a downgrade over the estimate. They over the didn't estimate. lose sales tax revenue. It's still a lot, but it's just not as far off. Not okay. Okay. The estimate has come in about $6 million less than as we previously estimated, um, which as of right now has eaten up that deficit, uh, that surplus that we left at the end of the legislative session. Um, Ooh, good we did that. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, and this will all, again, get updated in November when we do the December 1 letter. But as of right now, 
were fine because we did have that, that surplus. Okay, good. Always good not to spend that into the last cent. All right. Well, would have spent into the reserves. So it yes, we would have spent into the reserves. Okay. Other questions? Always be last. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> <Before lunch. laughs> All right, committee, I think that's it. Unless we have any other business, we'll be back in September 19th, right? 17th. 16th. 16th. Yeah. Are you Monday, 16th. Over the who, that, that's 16th. 16th. First, that's what we came up with. Ah. Just making sure everybody's okay with those things. <laughs> I have no idea. Monday the 16th, September 16th, and November 1st, and uh, November 1st, we'll be at 133 State Street in Boardville. The State House will be closed. Oh, I'm going to have to send us lots of reminders. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. don't expect us to remember that. It's a beautiful room, by the way. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, we'll national still have all that stuff. Okay. We need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. We know her. Wow. Yeah, September 6th. Yeah, it's right near the end.